So, Jake, we're back. Today, we are joined by Alexi Hamblin. And Alexi is the founder of the luxury streetwear brand, River God. And basically, we've been wanting to speak with Alexi basically since we started the podcast, really, haven't we? And uh, the reason for that is because he's a 20-year-old guy. He started this brand off his own back. And I think we can learn quite a few lessons from him. Definitely. He's a student of streetwear. He's a student of Warwick University. He's got a personal TikTok with over 20,000 followers and I think over a million likes. So he's clearly doing something right. So yeah, today we want to ask him how to grow a social media presence, how to start your own brand, discuss all the lessons that he's learned along the way from top fashion creators. So yeah, strap yourselves in guys. This one should be fascinating. So I used to do YouTube when I was a lot younger. Yeah. Uh, when I, you know, back in the face, I never wanted to be a YouTuber. Um, so like I was u- always used to editing myself, like doing, like hearing my voice, uh, making videos and stuff. So like, it's not that weird to me anymore. No. Like it's kind of, I've been, kind of been on a camera now for, how old am I now? Ne- nearly like a decade. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're used to it. Yeah. I, I The question I also have is like, you know, those TikToks, they are so slick that you do. Like basically you're talking for that entire time. Are you, do you script those? Like like you do, but then you but then you talk to camera. So what are you doing? Are you like looking at it and then like, how does it work? <laughs> it's something that no one will ever actually see. Um, yeah. but I'm, happy, I'm happy to ex- explain. Yeah. Um, so the TikToks take so long to make um <laughs> like i script them and because i'm trying to talk so fast to with the algorithm to get all the uh, you know t- t- attention span yeah i trip over my words constantly and you know so many times i've I've like so i script everything to about a minute long of content yeah i pro- the actual recording is probably about four to five minutes uh and then i'm having to like glance at the screen remember a sentence glance back at the camera i much prefer the videos where i'm doing it without any camera because i can just read from a script and it comes out a lot better yeah whereas i'm doing it from a camera kind of like having to look yourself in the eye when you're making the content you just lose focus and you're like i look a bit odd like oh my hair's a bit out of place and you kind of forget what we're going to say but i had a really dodgy one recently as a result of this so you know i've I've been doing these these documentary videos yeah um the one i did about bape and nego um well saying the word nego quite fast uh, TikTok thought I was saying something else and oh, the automatic captions were you know and it, it started to blow up right before I went to sleep and I started getting comments saying mate you need to check the uh, the captions so I, I was like oh shit like oh. deleted that straight away yeah so <laughs> well that's not your fault like the captions f- the captions are automatic do you know what I mean it's not you should be able to edit you. the automatic captions yeah but you can't do it anymore um, um, they've yeah, made it so true. if you want to edit them you have to like overlay them and I do them all in Premiere Pro, like all the captions, because yeah. I can do it faster and stuff. But yeah, yeah it's... Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What an absolute man. <laughs> Brilliant. But I love those TikToks. You I love think, them Yeah, well. yeah, I think they're awesome, mate. They're, Thank you very, they're very much. Infor- they're very... Um, you learn something from them as well, which I think people like as well. We're gonna we're gonna get into TikTok. We've got a lot of questions about TikTok. Yeah. No, that's absolutely fine. Like, I'm... Like, you know, aside from uh, River God and stuff, I do a lot of consultancy uh where i'm literally putting together people's tiktok strategies for them now mm. I, mean, I only have like twenty three thousand followers i think it is um but it's it's the, the way it's all changed recently is that it doesn't really matter how many followers you've got um because my videos usually will always get far more than i have followers you know like sure. i constantly have videos in the hundreds of thousands uh, and i have people commenting like whenever i release a new like the documentary video people come like oh this is my favorite series on tiktok and i go on their page they don't even follow me so, <laughs> you know like i don't it's so sad yeah. isn't it youtube's the same isn't it like people you don't often subscribe to people on youtube but you always would watch their content it's a bit it's weird because algorithms are so well made these days that you just don't even need to express much much interest they they just know if you like something so yeah. They know that you've yeah. watched it all the way through. Like, that's the simplest thing. And also, your documentary videos, it's not a dance. It's not like a five-second video. Like, people will have to watch the minute-long piece. Do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, yeah and that's something that I have, like... So, I do them in parts, usually, if it's, like, a particularly, like, long story. Like, I can't cover how someone started a brand in the 1980s and then did everything they've done up until 2022 in 60 mm. seconds, you know? Sure. Um, and if you do anything longer than... You know, like, I think it's there's a sort of optimal range you want to go for is 55 to 65 seconds. Okay. Anything more, it just won't really push it out. Sure. Yeah, and, like, because your, like, completion rate will be super low because, you know, no one's watching videos that long on TikTok. So, and I always get people commenting saying things like, um, oh, like, why are you doing a part two? Why are you doing a part three? Like, oh, I'm not going to like this because it's part one. First of all, I'm like, okay, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but secondly, it's because, like, 
if I was to make it like two or three minutes long, it would wouldn't get like no. half as many views, and then it would be pointless for me to because they take hours to make. They're not like. I don't just film it and then post it like someone doing like a dance or like showing their ass or something. <laughs> we've we've thought about doing yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I've been tempted myself, but, um, but no, that's kind of yeah. They take a long time to make. So go for, like for me, right? I'm pretty much a TikTok novice, right? And we're trying to grow our own TikTok, and I think a lot of people that will end up watching are like keen about TikTok. They use it as a platform, but wouldn't necessarily be a creator on it. So. Go like step by step for me. Like, if you were creating a TikTok, what is the process from scripting all the way to publishing it? So, like at first, it was a lot of trial and error. Uh, like my first videos were so bad. Like I think I started around May, and they were just like so cringy, shot really badly. Uh, and I started to realize that you know, when videos started to pick up a little bit, I started to realize patterns in them that were doing particularly better, and you'd need that three second hook at the start. I'd even sure. say one second hook now, because you know people are so used to swiping now that if you don't grab in the first sure. instant, and I found these documentary videos, I've done like some tests. If I start the title a, like a second later, the you know it completely drops how many views it gets. Even if I re-edit it and take a second off, it, it gets thousands more views. So that first three seconds is super, super important. Um, hashtags don't really matter these okay. days it's all about the actual content because the algorithm is so strong now and it's got so much data on everyone they know what people you know like you know if if x person likes this you know there's people that are similar to their interests that will, will like it too so hashtags aren't i still do them sure. like it's kind of just like you know ritual at this point but i'd say when scripting yeah the first three seconds are really important don't give away like the big bit of info or the exciting part of the content until kind of around 40 seconds in like you don't want to leave it right to the end um because people will get bored um but you need to have a bit of build up to it and make it feel like it's more valuable than it maybe actually is um so that's kind of what i do i i really try and i make sure there's no gaps in like when i'm speaking like it's super super fast like i'm basically rapping when i'm talking yeah um and i'm having to like you know like speak fast and then like chop out any gaps between anything so like it's very in your face you're getting it straight away like what you've just had time to process one thing and it's hitting you with the next bit of information um but i'd say in terms of like a wider sort of actually like context of the content storytelling is just absolutely the way like mm. storytelling is it's like it's so important uh, and that's like kind of what changed things for me was when i started to say rather because i used to do videos like how to style jeans. <laughs> then I just wear River God t-shirts in it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got like, like 300 people views. People can see through that, can't they, now as well. I think consumers are getting ever more savvy that you're just trying to disguise marketing and stuff. And so I think what you do really well is you're actually starting to bring people value now, right? Through storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, like through my own stories. Like the whole idea behind the... Um, the documentary videos. So a lot of them, the first sort of five or six, I've done about 30 now, but the first five or six... Um, they're actually from research I did when I was 15, 16. Like when I went into this, like I made sure I got like a lot, um, you know, like I knew basically what I was like, what other brands were doing from then. So the idea I started doing those was like, I realized so much of my content was about how I'm doing this, how I'm building that, why I'm doing this. And I kind of run out of stuff to talk about. Like, yeah. cause like it, there's not, you know, I can't pump out content every day and keep doing things every day while totally. being a student and yeah, we're, whilst, not, we're not yeah. as interesting as we like to yeah. think we are, are we? <laughs> yeah yeah but you know sean stussy is very interesting um nigo is very interesting you know so the idea was is that i would do these videos um and people would see how they built theirs and you know whilst it's also inspiring and formative may give people motivation to do their own thing when they follow and they engage my other content gets pushed to them too and it's a good way of getting thousands of people seeing my content with the river God logo at the top so it mm. sort of associates that um, but it's also so like people when they start getting fed the river god content they're kind of like oh hold on this guy's might be on something too like yeah. he's you know he knows what he's talking about well hopefully people think that i, I hope <laughs> yeah, so yeah. i mean that's a, a, an assumption but you know like yeah so that's kind of the idea behind them um and it's been going really well like what's interesting now as well which something i wasn't expecting to happen is if you search river god into tiktok it comes up with river god palace river god cortez so it's that instant association now that people have with river god and his brand so that's kind of it so i'd say yeah storytelling and value-based content like i think they call it edutainment yeah like that's kind of i kind of fell into that by accident and it's mm. by far the way to go i'd say 
And I think what's really telling about the content when we watch it is that you are really passionate about it because if you weren't passionate about it, you wouldn't be able to do all of this research. Like like you say, like for one TikTok, how, how many hours would you say roughly it takes? I couldn't really give you an average, um, if I'm honest. Um, I'll give some examples, though. Yeah. Um, so when it's something like when the brand isn't that big and the information is quite hard to access, like mm. the one I did yesterday uh, about Unknown London, you know, they're, they're a relatively big brand these days, but it's not like a brand that's been around for 30 years that there's countless interviews, so many articles. Like, I have to really deep dive sure. for that. It's not a Wikipedia page ready to go for you to just read off. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> like, I have to really dig and find, like, some obscure interviews they've done and all that sort of stuff. Um, so those take a bit longer. Those will take um, maybe, like, 40 minutes to an hour to script because um, I don't... I got caught out the other day. I did a video about V-Loan and I used a dodgy source in it and got some of the information wrong. And, you know, that's something I still got comments on daily. People going, like, oh, that's cap. And it's like, well, yeah. you know, like, I've apologized. Like, I made a video where the, sec the second part was like a disclaimer, like, I'm sorry, there's, a, you know, misinformation in the first one. But the, um, uh, what would I say? Yeah, the, the BAPE ones are pretty easy to make. Um, but the biggest, the longest part of it actually is the... Um, is getting all the pictures and videos like to go with what I'm saying because like I can't like when I'm giving a certain point I want to try and find a picture from that exact moment mm. like when it's like the the Stussy one well Stussy sorry because people have a go at me for saying it's Stussy um, <laughs> we were having a big debate about that last yeah, night it's, <laughs> I don't know like yeah. just say Stussy to avoid argument um, yeah. but when I was talking about him designing his own um, like surfboards and stuff like to actually find pictures from the 80s from his like little garage of him making took ages um but it, it adds i feel like it adds a lot more like authenticity and sort of life to the content so you know it's an s and I, I enjoy doing it so and I, I get quite obsessive uh when i'm doing these things like i w once i've started it it's not i'm not doing anything else until it's finished no and yeah. like you say it is a documentary like yeah. there's no no one should belittle that content if it, even if it's short form totally. it is a full-length documentary you're telling a story and you're getting to the end of it and yeah if it's three parts that's three minutes but bloody hell the amount it's... of knowledge you get from that short piece of clip is sometimes more than i get from like a 20 minute youtube totally. video. You know if it's I mean? valuable it's, it's valuable you know, and that's why I think you struggle a lot with scrolling through TikTok, people not bringing you value. You know, before you could just post a dance and then do a bit of marketing in there as well. But now people are really seeing through stuff that doesn't bring people value. So fair play to you, I think. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, what me and Josh find really interesting is that obviously a lot of people are putting their faces to their brands nowadays. So I guess the question we have is, do you think nowadays that a product is not enough? You know, do do people need to to put a face to the brand in order for it to to go stratospheric? Uh, I would say almost like categorically yes. Um, I think with these days, with you know all of the things that are constantly being publicised by journalists about all these big companies that are you know abusing staff or like their you know corruption all this sort sure. of stuff, like you kind it, having that face to a brand gives you that gives that accountability uh to the person and you kind of you can trust it better and there's there's literal like literal empirical evidence that i found before i decided to take this leap myself um was that these days kind of the startups that are really blowing up the last few years like their founders have far more followers than the brand does because you know this is so when i changed it was only i was never going to be the face of the brand I, like although the designs are very personal to me i'm not i was never that sort of person that wanted to do that but it got to around, um, I think it was April. I decided I wanted to change the name to River Gods to River God by Alexi Hamblin. And the thought process behind that was, you know, let's say you take take two like really nice, well-designed, well-made t-shirts, put them both in the studio, take a picture of them in the studio. They both look great. But one of them, you know all about the person, how much work they've put into it, the inspirations, the story, where they want to take it. You know, and like how it's made, why it why it's costed it, what it is, versus one that's just some big Instagram brand that you know nothing about and have no clue who's made it. You know, the one that has the story behind it is always going to be almost intrinsically more valuable than the other one. So that's kind of what I would say if if we're going right down to like T-shirts. But I think these days, yeah, there's such a lack of trust in big companies that having a story and having someone to buy into as well as that, like I just think that's. It's, it's it's a trend that's going to become very big. Like it already is, but mm. like it's it's what's done it for me. And it's like look at look at Tesla, like like Elon Musk. You know, like 
from a lot i'm not i'm not much of a car man myself but mm -hmm. my family are really into cars and they don't really like teslas they don't really think they're that that brilliant but musk will always sell he, mm, he yep. you know like he, he's just because people buy into him totally. buy, yeah it's the twitter thing now as well with musk isn't it people will start buying blue ticks and they they already <laughs> they already have to yeah. be fair yeah so yeah no fascinating and, and to be fair yeah you've come back to something again which is storytelling and having a story you know josh and i have only you know fairly recently started to bring our faces to invest day haven't we yeah and um we think is a good move just to yeah give a bit of transparency to to the brand as well because there's so much out there now for people to buy and you know you're not going to dif necessarily differentiate with with your product so it's how do you differentiate with the story mm -hmm. i think it's hard because when you get to like i'm looking into the future and i'm like right when i'm a 40 year old guy is my face being on the brand still going to be as impactful as as what it would be now as a 30 year old or you even as a 20 year old so if you're thinking like in the future are you like my personal brand will always be my personal brand but maybe river god will have to grow beyond me or is it like one of those things where you're sort of like i back myself like i you know even with age i still think i can connect <laughs> with people do you know what i mean because like there'll be the next level of people that come through it's funny that you mentioned this because like it's i wouldn't say it's polarizing like my approach like like with like you know people that follow me but I've had some people love the fact that there's like, you know, a person that you can buy into all this sort of stuff. Um, but I've had a few comments that really make me laugh. It's like, I love your brand, but try and separate yourself from it more. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, sorry, am I not, you know, like, do you not, not like me? Enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, like, I don't know. I, I've kind of, I don't really do long term plans because yeah. I think the the art to a successful startup these days is what they ham down our fucking throats of the business school is pivoting yeah. is being able, is making sure that you don't you know that you're fully capable of quickly changing position quickly changing your marketing quickly changing your target you know all this sort of stuff so i don't believe that i'm always going to have the same energy to be on like hey guys here's you know today's content you know that's not going to be me my whole life but right now it's a very viable way of growing the business and i think when it gets to a point that if it does grow enough everyone will kind of just know what i'm about anyway sure. um but you know look at um represent with George Heaton, they've kind of done, I've kind of doing what the opposite of what they're doing. They're doing like, right, so, you know, we're this huge brand now, here's our journey. But I'm trying to do it the other way around. So it's like, you know, for them, you get all these stories of entrepreneurs that are like, yeah, we started this, you know, 10 million pound startup from our bedroom. But what I'm trying to do is show people from the bedroom, you know, so they can, they can see it from the very start and then watch it grow. And I think you're right, it will get to a point where like, there will be like I personally think the products speak for themselves, but you know there's a uh, these days like as I said I don't think it's quite enough um, to have that. So as soon as River God cemented in the market for what just the clothing, you know like I don't think I'm going to be you know doing like these TikTok videos anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I'm not rolling it out obviously because I I do enjoy it and it's nice to get that sort of real time feedback on ideas, um, but. Yeah, I, I can't, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Like, because these bubbles always burst. Like, mm -hmm. and you're starting to see it slowly now with TikTok too, is that because there's more advertisers on the platform, you know, they're prioritizing getting their advertisers slots rather than the organic growth. It's the same thing that happened with Instagram, yep. YouTube, all these sorts of things. So, you know, I probably always, I, I quite enjoy being like, like one thing I love about this approach is that I, I'd say, like, I don't have many followers, but I'd say daily I get DMs from people saying, I love what you're doing. Like, Sometimes I just say that. I just love yeah. what you're doing. I love what like what you're striving towards. Some people are like, I love what you're doing, but you know, like, can you like can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And I think it's 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 really fulfilling to me that while also people appreciate what I'm building, they feel like they can reach out to me for advice. Like, and I think that's a, quite a differentiation between River God. Totally. Because like what other brand that positions themselves as luxury is literally helping their customers totally. try and compete with them. <laughs> like, yeah, true. And you don't know where the front door is with a lot of these brands as well. You, you know, there's no face to it. They're completely just, you know, they're ghosts almost, aren't they? So no, if you can give something back, there's, you know, there's no better feeling in the world than actually helping other people. Yeah. So.
can we can we summarize right so say for instance like an 18 year old came to you tomorrow mm -hmm. and i know you answer this all the time but, it, but this is a good forum to sort of do it maybe that you'll get less questions now. <laughs> but like an 18 year old comes to you and says look i i'm really into fashion i'm also doing a business degree i really want to get into this and i want to create my own streetwear company what would you like what is your like three key Blueprint. pieces of advice yeah to to do them i know this is a really hard one but... no it, it's it's not necessarily that it's a hard question it's more that it's just there's just so many angles you can you can hit with this um but i'd say based off what we've been saying just to keep it you know on theme um you need to have something clear that the brand stands for like it's all well and good having a cool logo it's all well and good making a cool t-shirt but everyone can make a cool t-shirt mm. like i've designed for 500 brands well probably more than 500 brands these days and i've designed a lot of cool t-shirts you know so you need to have a purpose and that purpose doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, we're sustainable. Sure. Like the purpose can be like um, with VLone, for example, they were targeting the sort of like, so I don't know how, how, how I phrased it, but it was like, you know, people who feel like they've got like fake friends, like they feel like they're quite, you know, lonely, okay. they're, they're popular, but they're lonely. Um, you know, it's about having that kind of relatable like concept that sure. people can buy into and feel like, you know, wearing it is, is a token something. of it. Yeah. Um, another one would be um, research the concept of bootstrapping. Uh, it's something that we're taught in business. It's something that I believe they should teach kind of everyone at GCSE level uh, these days with the way that, you know, everyone's moving towards business. But bootstrapping, um, if you didn't know, making the most of what you can have access to, you know. Yeah. So, for example, like when I used to do my photo shoots, I would get, I'd put like a little box, you know, patch box in my front porch uh, I would put, get two whiteboards behind it and then I'd Photoshop it to look at, to look like it was in a studio. That's an example of bootstrapping. Like I didn't have to pay for a studio. I didn't have to pay for a high quality camera. It's just through using the resource that I had. Yeah, it's about it's about money, using that as effectively as you can. It's about using your talents as effectively as you can your and network. your friends, your network and that sort of thing. So yeah. It's, yeah, it's like exactly maximizing that. the most you possibly can out of, yeah. out of the the hand you dealt really isn't it you know? yeah that's a far better weapon <laughs> um but yeah so those two um and i'd also say like you need like in the current way things are going you need to have like experience in content creation uh whether that be photo video like because there are so many brands that do have that um that if you try and enter a, comp a really saturated market with people that are already one step ahead of you you know, it's just not going to work um, unless you have the money to pay someone else to do it. But I, I do believe that, like, as a startup phase, you need to have that. And I think that's why I've been able to grow so fast is because I have background in photo editing, video editing. Um, and it means that, like, there's a good quote from um, Clint of Cortez. Uh, I don't know it verbatim, but it's like he says, you know, you can make the best T-shirt in the world. But if you can't communicate properly that it's the best T-shirt in the world, it's pointless. Mm. So, yeah, kind of. I suppose, you know, marketing as well, but I believe that content is absolutely like the forefront of marketing these days. It's all about content, all about content. So that's what I'd say. Content, bootstrapping and purpose, uh, which I hope is kind of a bit of a different response that no. than other like people say like i've not really heard the bootstrapping one before but it's been really valuable for me no and and this is really difficult to communicate as well because even people that have created their own businesses i think struggle to articulate how they sort of got there to people that are just starting off because like you say it's a it's a serious process isn't it like starting a business like it, it involves so many different factors you've got to think about so many different things true. and so to have that sort of three key piece of advice to sort of go yeah you've got to have a purpose like why why would you create a brand otherwise and you've got to be able to articulate it and then you've also got to know how to physically do it in terms of from a business perspective like that's super key like we run our business in a bootstrapped way totally. and and a lot of uh, I know a lot of people that have gone very early in their business journey and gone, I need to raise money super quickly. And that's the only way that I'm going to grow a business. If I have money and I can pay people, or I can put loads of money into marketing. And really, you, you don't really need that, do you? Like you, you can just start a streetwear brand with a, a couple of hundred quid or whatever, whatever it is, a grant or whatever it is, and go for it and, and try it. Because that's your experience, isn't it, really? Well, here's the thing. It's it's kind of so that's what i was going to do at first until i realized i could start making serious money designing for other people yeah uh so i just saved for that and then when i had like a lot more money i was like i could do with even more money and got a loan out yeah which i regret i wish i had done it more but like in terms of, so it was very weird what i did to be honest thinking about it like 
it had been such a burning passion since I was around 14, 15 to do it. So when it all kind of came about, I'm suddenly like, I've got so much money uh, to, yep. to do stuff with that was my money. It wasn't like, you yeah, know, yeah. it was like, like what, you know, it was so confusing because I'd, I'd never planned for that, for like, for that. Mm. So when it came to it, like there were some things that I put a lot of money into and other areas where I should have put money into, but I didn't. Like, for example, you know, I, I'd saved like, I don't, I'm not going to talk exact figures, but a lot of money for Facebook ads. But I didn't pay a photographer to do the photos for them. I did it all myself with 10 minutes of studio photography experience. Sure. Like, the pictures came out awfully, but I still put thousands into promoting them. And obviously, you know, if you see like a slightly blurry, weird looking picture of a t-shirt that's 70 quid, you're not going to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, again, that's where I pivoted. I'm like, you know, okay, what, what do I have? I have a phone, I have a tripod, I have a bedroom to sit yep. in and talk. And just started talking. And that's when everything changed because that's, you know, using the literally bare bones resource that I had. So if I was to go back and start again, that's absolutely what I would do. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd also, there's an interesting concept we learned um, in the business school at Warwick is minimum viable product um, MVP, uh, which basically is like the earliest version of a product that kind of reflects what it's going to be that you can test with customers. Sure. Um, so, you know, like a, it's, it's like a, it's like a functional prototype because not all prototypes are functional, like by definition, but so something that you would take out to customers. So it's you haven't invested too much, so you yep. can easily adapt and change your business model based off of that. And I think that's what I would have done with the patch idea. Is that I think like although I you know I'm really happy with how it came out. I think I would have maybe instead of doing six sets and three luxury jumpers from the, from day one, maybe just done like one jumper like three just sets as an yeah as an MVP as you said. Yeah, just to see what people would would think of it. Um, but you know I was too tunnel visions and to like adamant that I was going to do it a certain way that you know but that's I'm changing my approach now I'm doing sure. yeah because it's like if people didn't love the patch idea no matter if you had a million patches they're still not going to like the concept are they so yeah no that's uh, an important reflection I think um yeah let's interesting let's jump back in time then so you um, you said that you've been designing for hundreds of brands and stuff. So presumably at school and stuff, you did design. How did you start to go out into the to the world and say, right, I want to design clothing for you? And were you just doing that as freelance? Were you employed? How old were you? So I've, I've never done any design, never okay. done any art or any design education in my life. Um, my parents are very artistic people. Um, and my brother did art GCSE. Like it's something like, like my house is filled with paintings that my parents have done. Um, so like I've always grown up around that. But the real reason I got into graphic design was so do you know like the match attacks football trading cards? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I used to be obsessed with those when I was a kid. Um, and I used to be really frustrated that it was only Premier League. Like you couldn't get Messi, Ronaldo when they were playing in um, La Liga. So I, my granddad had Photoshop installed on this computer and I got him to teach me how to Photoshop match tags to like put myself and my mates no. in them and stuff. And I was like 10. <laughs> so like I kind of like from then on, like I knew the basics of Photoshop. And then I started designing like like FIFA, like Ultimate Team cards. And I started, when I was a bit younger, I started designing um, like banners and like logos for, for YouTubers. Um, and I kind of was getting, slowly getting into fashion because I wasn't very confident when I was younger. And like fashion was kind of one of the only things that would like, you know, it was like a way of expressing myself, whether feeling confident or that sort of stuff. And then I kind of just got interested in doing my own clothes, like designing, like I kind of, cause I really loved certain brands, but I couldn't afford them. Like I don't come from much money. Like it wasn't, I would, if I want something, I had to go out and work sure. and get it. So I wanted to do my own stuff, like where I could really personalize it and be myself. So River God was already a thing before I started doing freelance. Like. It wasn't released anywhere, but it, I'd been designing and sampling for about two years. Like I started des like designing and sampling for River God when I was 16, I think. I might have been 17. Uh, no, 16. Um, and what, what was that? What did that involve? Did that just involve searching on Google? Like, um, or did you know a bit more than that? Pardon? So what I used to, like YouTube tutorials have been basically like like a tutor to me. Like I've learned so much from YouTube. I've learned so much from like random articles online. Um, excuse me. But yeah um so in terms of manufacturing then i would just go on to alibaba i would nice. basically say to the manufacturers like what do you need from me like i had no idea of anything like i I could make a mock-up but i didn't know anything about measurements i didn't know how like what tech packs were like how that worked or international shipping um so many times i'd have things held in customs because i didn't realize there was import packs <laughs> and i didn't and i'd used all my money to buy the samples so i had to just sit there um 
so like you know that was that was that whole thing um and i i so i basically got the manufacturers to teach me how to you know send off tech sure. packs and design them then it got to around november 2019 and i i used to do a lot of depop reselling like i, I was like nice. a fiend for that when i was younger like i would go um charity shopping all around oxford I'd, i had like a there was a market where there used to be this woman that would like resell like like bulk vintage clothes that I would go and help us up in return for getting first dibs and everything on a Saturday morning market. So like I was always like kind of grafting in that in the in in fashion and in clothing, but it was always always the bottom line was for River God, for River God, for River God. So it got to November twenty nineteen, things were drying up a bit. Like everyone was when like all the sort of private school people, you know, like all the uh all the raw where's my backy girls, you know, like when they, when, they, when they all started getting on the whole Y2K vibe, you know. So like I, I lost, I lost all my stock. Like you know, they they stole everything from me. Sure. So I had to change, and uh, it was one of my friends actually um, who basically said, "Look, you've done so much work for Rivergod. Like, why don't you use that as a portfolio and try and design for other brands?" And I was like, oh, "This is never going to go anywhere." Um, but I, I set up a gig on Fiverr, you know, the freelance sure. website, yep. thinking nothing of it, just like dumping it there. Like the prices were so cheap as well. Like, like it was like twenty dollars for like a premium design that I'd spent hours on. Um, yeah. I don't even know why. I, did. I think I just did it because I was just like. Oh, were you offering right like logo design or just any kind of design, t-shirt design or just anything anyone wanted? You were happy <laughs> yeah. to take their money yeah. off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, it was pretty much just anything streetwear. Like, like I could do logos, but I'm I'm much better with more like like bigger like like bigger visuals like sure. sort of. So I wouldn't necessarily do um, logos like if I if I could avoid doing logos I would because I'm, I don't really work with Illustrator I work sure. with Photoshop and that you know that's kind of what they're for. Um, but I'd say it, it slowly started building up and I was like, oh, okay, it's actually making decent money now. Decent money then was very different to what decent money is now, you know. <laughs> um, but it was it was going really. Well. I was really excited. I was loving it. I was loving designing for other brands. Like my skills are being developed because like so many times I do design for a brand. Uh, and the whole time I'd be doing, I'd be googling how to do certain techniques. Like it was like, I'd be learning as I was you're going. Wing, yeah, you're winging it, right? Yeah, completely. That's completely how I went through it. And then lockdown happened. Uh, it was during my A level year, so I was one of the lucky ones that just, just give my predicted grades. <laughs> so that was, you know, I had no stress over summer, so it was just all work, work, work. Um, and so I started to do like like a stupid amount. Like I was doing like nine, ten hours like a day of designing for brands. Like I had fifteen usually 15 clients on the go at one time. And then one day I was like, I've got so many five-star reviews now because I'd always do unlimited revisions. Because like as someone that was doing, a, I think that's kind of what, what why people came to me is because I wasn't just a graphic designer who'd, who'd done like graphic education. Like I'd, I was doing it from the position of someone who was growing a brand who sure. knows the market. So like I kind of had the eye that people wanted. I wasn't necessarily the best designer on the platform, but I was always the, I, like I was the top seller for streetwear and fire wow. for a while. Um, but then one day, I think it was like would have been around April 2020 uh, or May even. I was like, you know, what? I'm going to double my prices and see what happens. And my orders doubled in volume, uh, and I had a, had a waiting list that had gone for ages. And it was because all my five star reviews they stayed on the platform, and it looked like people had given me five star reviews for that price. So people were like, hold on, this must be like a really premium service. Um, so, I mean, I was just like, I was so burnt out and like had so many, stu like, I used to play Monopoly with my mates on Xbox in the evenings and I just get into such like awful arguments with them. <laughs> like, I can't repeat what I said on here, but you know, I said some really stupid said, give things. me fucking Park Lane, you prick. Yeah. It was worse yeah. than that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I used to get like proper like burnt out, but it was worth it. Like in my head, it was always the drive to be able to, release river god like i used to do this thing with my clients was to understand how startups worked i do a survey where it was supposed to improve my uh improve my service for future brands it was just me doing market research it was understanding the budgets people started with how many pieces they released how many you know things they stocked all the questions that you would ask maybe like someone on tiktok what do i do i'd ask maybe about 50 or 60 brands what they wow. do so i could put their money that they've given me for the designs um which, you know, I put a lot of effort into. Like, I'm not just saying, you know, the designs were all like, I've, I was proud of about 90% of them. Some of them, a client would want to change so much that it would just look weird, you know. Sure. Um, but if they're happy, then, you know, yeah, exactly. the client's happy. I, I think that's kind of why I slightly started to fall out of love with it because I still do it now uh, because it's just like, like, in all honesty, it's such good money for how long it takes to do. And I just, it's just more money to keep funneling into Rivergod, yeah. you know. Um, but 
I started to lose love for it when like so many of my designs I didn't like and I didn't see any future for the brand. Like I'd worked with so many brands now I knew what was going to work and what wasn't going to sure. work. And it just felt like doing work, even though the pay was really good, like that's not really what fulfills me. It's no. the impact and creation that I really enjoy. Um, so yeah, like that's, I kind of lost love for it. But, you know, I've designed for so many brands and I've designed... It's annoying because like all the exciting ones to talk about, they make you sign NDAs because they don't want people to know oh, they found okay. their designers on Fiverr. I see. But there are some big, big brands uh, that I've worked with, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers. There's one that's even like, oh, I really, I'll tell you guys after the podcast. Sure. That's um, fine. But like a global. We'll tell you all after, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get me in, get me in trouble. Yeah, but, uh, so we've got a new subscription we're going to start. <laughs> <laughs> we want uh, secret information. It's Patreon. Yeah, Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, get me sued yeah but nah it's um so like i, I it's something that i've loved doing but i think this what is kind of leads into the new direction that i'm going to talk about with river god today i did a video about it last night but i have designed literally hundreds of graphic t-shirts like the ones you see for river god don't look like any of the other ones that's the whole point is mm. that river god t-shirts are not designed to look like other ones but i realized now that i'm quite jaded from designing so many graphics and so many t-shirts so many hoodies that I kind of want to prove to people that I can do more than that. And I know people don't see me as just like a graphic yeah. guy, but that's how I see myself because I've done so much of it. Um, so You don't want to pigeonhole yourself? No, not at all. So the new mission is I'm really trying to work on more fashion pieces now, like cargoes, jackets, you know, which, you know, a lot of brands do, but I'm doing it all in the UK. And the issue with doing it in the UK is that if you work with like a Chinese or a Pakistani manufacturer, they have they source all the zips for you they source all the different like you know cuffs all the, like everything you know every part of a garment will be done in house in the uk it's it's not that at all like if you want a good manufacturer they they specialize in you know cutting and sewing and putting the fabric together then you've got to find a specialist for the fabric a specialist for the zips a specialist for the drawstring so you know not only is it difficult to try and draw everything myself and you know learn a new way of you know getting the fit right getting you know like making like a competitive product but it's also the whole business side of things and the sourcing side which is another whole game to me because my manufacturers i've used before they kind of do everything for you you just tell them what you want and you'll sample and you know you'll get it back sure. eventually but this time you know i've kind of i want to have a lot more control over the supply chain because Although I'm very satisfied with the guys I use first hand and, and you know and I'm very trustworthy of their um they're very trusting of their uh sustainability pledges and their certifications. If I can actually go to the factories myself for everything, then yeah. I know that it's good, you know. Like I know it's safe and I know that, you know, there's far less carbon emissions if I do it all in the UK. Yep. And I'd rather rather than doing more graphic pieces that kind of crowd out my current portfolio as a new brand, like if I were to release more graphic t shirts you know, it just competes out my other products. So I'm I'm focusing more on complementary products. So there'll be less frequent drops, but just know that when they do come out, they're gonna. There's so much is gonna go into each garment, and they'll be quite limited too. But that nice. because it's so expensive getting stuff made in the UK, man. Like mm. it's ridiculous. Um, but that's kind of the new direction I'm going in now as a result of doing so many, like so much work for other brands. It's just kind of I just need a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's where we're at now. That's the next mission with River God. Got it. When is that? When is that launching? Like, when's all the new stuff coming? It's a work in progress. I've been. I spent the last week um, testing out fabrics with different uh, companies. Testing out. Um, I've I've ordered some zip samples, um, but you know I have got nothing. Heard nothing back from the company. Some company in Leicester that are sending me a lot of different drawstrings with different aglets on them to wow. decide. So <clears throat> it's kind of like that's kind of the next step, and it's something that like. I'm going to take my time with. I'm not going to rush. And I know obviously like, because River God isn't a brand that I'm trying to build hype around. Like, you know, of how many brands I've covered in these things, like you, you I, I've seen so many times how the hype just dies with a brand and it becomes impossible to rebuild. So I'm just building River God as a consistently high quality, well thought out brand. Like I'm never mm. going to do anything that's going to try and make it hyped and then die. Like I don't want that inconsistency. Like I just want consistent, steady growth. Sure. That's what I'm aiming for. Um, so yeah, it's a work in progress, but it'll be out hopefully February. The first piece will be out. I want to speak quickly about um, the value that you found from like in real life events, right? Because I think uh, going on what you just said there, it's really hard to prove to people the value of your products online. So that's the first question that I have for you. How do you say to people, look, these products are top class. They're made in the UK. They're quality. 
you you said at the start it's about showing people rather than telling people so how do you physically do that online when you know there's so many different options in the market so to answer the first question um about in-person events um i love doing them they're a lot of fun like they're a really good way of not only like building that community and sort of giving that you know people like when i did the last one i did uh, a few weeks ago in london like a collaborative one I had maybe like 60, 70 people come up to me being like, oh, like, I watch your videos, like, and I was like, whoa, this is really weird. <laughs> um, <but laughs> You're an like, influencer oh, now, mate. <laughs> You're an influencer. Right, well, either way, I, don't, I wouldn't call myself an influencer. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to influence people to buy my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so it, it's nice to have that real life connection with people. Um, you know, that's what I like. And it's something, again, it's something I, I kind of tried to do everything with the brand that I would want as a customer because I am such a massive consumer and always have been of, of fashion and streetwear. That I just want to, I know that I would want more in-person events that are easily accessible. I'd want to go to pop-ups. I want to go to parties. The parties are great because I get to design like a whole atmosphere around the products. Like it's not just, you know, here's a cool t-shirt. It's like welcome to kind of where, like what my mind was doing when I was designing them, you know, like with all mm. the blue and like all the ravey, weird, glitchy videos that I do on all the screens, nice. like the big crisp, like it's kind of hard to explain. Like I've never done any education in art, so I'm not really able to articulate very well like why I do certain things. But to me, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. So. You created like an experience. Yeah. So like explain to people because like we know what you've done, but like explain to people like the events you've actually done. So you've done pop ups, you've done nights out, and where were they and and what happened? So I've done uh, five in person events now over the last year. Um, the first one was at oh no, the very first one was on launch day, and it was in Oxford, and it was a uh, Bear in mind, I'd only been able to legally go clubbing for like two months because of COVID <laughs> and being so young. That, you know, I decided to try and do a whole, like, run out a whole nightclub and uh, design it all and run the whole night myself when I had, I, I, like, I'd only been on like four nights out in my life. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Which was, a, it, you know, but I like, I, I got to design the whole, like, all of the lights. Like, I could choose how it all, all went and it all worked. I got, there was loads of screens in the, in the, in the event. Uh, in the place that I got to make loads of videos to put on the screens, you know, again, using some of my like video editing skills. So I, I, I set all the screens up to look like the sort of videos you'd see in like a, like a 90s sort of rave, you know, in the background like that, but incorporated like my branding and my products into it. So that was kind of like, uh, uh, oh yeah we also made a cocktail for the night that that night that River was my favorite cocktail. Yeah. what was it called well i called it um rvgd absolute to try and keep it like fancy but everyone just called it river <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's like a, it's a cult thing now because it's basically a blue lagoon but like double strength sure. um but like it makes everyone's tongue blue so like every time i'm talking about doing an event everyone's like the river vod's gonna be there like they're gonna be so like there's a bit of a cult thing that i'm building Stuck. with the brand you know um so that that's their fun. They were really good. Like I, you know, I got all the DJs myself. Like a few live performances. Um, then the second one was the first box park in Shoreditch. One I did. Um, that was the, I think that was before I met you guys. That was the first one I did. Uh, literally a month after I launched. It was more like I knew that it wasn't. It wasn't like a pop up to to really drive sales. It was more for an aware, awareness and to make a statement. Like you know, like I'm new in the market but i'm not scared to put myself out there you know in a new city in front of new people and i was shocked like i sold so much like i made i made profit on the event you know selling people would walk in and they'd see a t-shirt they've never seen before for 70 quid just see some kids stood there being like yeah i made this <laughs> and bought it you know uh which was awesome but uh, the, the kind of like the sort of um set pieces i do for my pop-up so you know i do the switch patch hoodies where you get the hoodie with the velcro on you can swap out for other patches I have a mannequin set up that on the wall has, uh, it has like the six sets on planks that I've put on the wall. So you can come in and you can swap out the patches on your jumper. Uh, or like, yeah, as you're trying one on, you can swap the patches out or you can do it on the mannequin to see how it works. The annoying thing about this though is that because like I always put my like fanciest pair of trousers on the on the uh, mannequin, I've had so many people that have walked past and be like, oh mate, can I get a pair of them? I'm like, no, they're not mine. <laughs> <laughs> they're just some random jeans. But they're great. Like I love doing the pop-ups. Um, I don't think I'll do box park again. Like I want to keep building, uh, and I've got a lot of ideas for the next collections pop-up, but that requires a lot more f creative freedom. So maybe Soho for the yeah. next one. Uh, and then I've done. I did another party. <coughs> basically the same thing again. Where uh, where were the parties? Uh, in Oxford. Um, because like most of my following these days is from London, but I grew up in Oxford. Well, I grew up. I say Oxford is some 
village outside of Oxford, but you know, we say Oxford because it sounds posher. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I do it there. And because it's where all my friends are, and I can sure. guarantee people come in. Yeah. Um, but like in the future, yeah, you pay them to go. Yeah, <laughs> feels like it. Not gonna lie, but yeah, no, the parties have always been really fun. Um, but I'm gonna be doing more London-based stuff because I'm moving to London next year after oh, my degree. Nice. Yeah, hopefully by sort of June time. So nice. Josh and I will be there, won't we? <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely be at the parties. We wanted to go to the last one, but I think it was on a Friday night a, when we were doing something. Tuesday? Yeah, what night of the week was oh, it? I to, yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare. Wasn't it a Tuesday? No. no, it was a. So it was originally a. So. At my sixth form, there's like a like a DMB collective that started up, um, like that I used to be mates with these guys, um, and they were throwing a party on the same night, which happened to uh, they were throwing a party on the night of my anniversary, um, which I, the party was for, and I couldn't, um, I I didn't want to do it on the same night because I want to compete because like I wanted to go to theirs, they probably wanted to come to mine, so I did it on a Thursday night originally. <laughs> And it got to like a week before and the ticket sales weren't that great. And I was like, oh, who's going to want to come to a Thursday party? Like, it's not like student times when, you know, like when, when everyone's at uni, like, so you just kind of go out like any day of the week. Like it, it was in the summer and people were on holidays. People had jobs. So I, um, yeah, I changed it to Friday, like a week before. And it was fine. You know, I, it went really well. I sold a load of tickets. But yeah, it was quite confusing. Uh, and I know that like, there was a lot of people that, wanted to come but then couldn't because i kept changing you know so it was a bit of a nightmare but it was a it was it was a fun and it's a good way of it's good for content too man like yeah yeah i've got a question on uh, for you on this right like you've mm. obviously like we we haven't explicitly said this but you're still a student uh you're still at uni you're at warwick uni do your friends or like I, even like maybe some of your family do they ever go like mate just be like a student like just enjoy uni like you're working your ass off you're you've got all of these other things going on do they ever say like just relax uh i kind of did in my first year like when i kind of moved in like first moved in with my flat and like we all get to know each other and i was like look, i'm doing all this and they were struggling with their degrees and they're like mate why would you like bother um it was a small minority of people, but I remember that explicitly people being like, just enjoy your time at uni. Yeah. But nah, like my family have always been super supportive. Like I, like, I was, I've always been so adamant of doing this that my mum's my basically said that I have to stay in uni and finish the degree, but she has no problem with me doing the brand. Like she's a big supporter of what I'm doing with it. But yeah, so uh, like I think now people kind of just know me and know what I do. Like, yeah. They just know that, that's, that I am, you know, like... I just do the brand and uni at the same time. Like it's just, it's natural for me, sure. you know. Um, I, I think you know the, the degree that I do is is relatively easy to be honest. Like it's a business degree, but I don't feel I feel like a lot of it is stuff that I have learnt myself anyway uh, through either my own experience um, or like through my own research because you know you have to do a lot of research to do your own company, and they kind of just teach you all that in a degree as well. Um, but it was funny the other day I was in a uh, in a branding uh, I've done a module about branding and communicating. Uh, I was in a lecture for that, and the slides came up on the screen and it was like teaching us what a publicity stunt was or like how you do it. And I was getting notifications on my phone from people actually actively engaging and posting about my first publicity stunt that I was doing at the same time. So it was like, okay, like I know this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think this is an, like a it's a question I get a lot is you know should I go to uni? You know, it's a big one. What's your answer, days. mate? Tell tell us. So, I'd love to. I'd love to know your perspective on it, especially for someone being there at uni right now. I think it's such a, it's such a situational based question. Um, but I do want to say to all those people like like Andrew Tate, you know, Sneaker or whatever that are like escape the matrix, don't go to university. Shut up, man. <laughs> like university, you don't get that this time much in your life. The, the three years where you can just fuck about. You can make friends. You can try things out. You don't get that any any of the time of life. And if you can get a student loan, it is basically free money. Like, you know, I, I, I really believe that university is one of those things that you just do for the experience, you know. And you can work a business around that experience. You, if you're really actually dedicated to escaping the matrix or whatever, do a business degree, learn it properly from people that have done it themselves, and then do your own company that way. Like, I don't I don't believe in this whole university is a waste of time i mean maybe if it's i mean i can only really speak from my perspective and my degree which is business which doesn't really funnel you into a certain career and i get that that's not it's not appealing to me sure um but i i do think it's one of those things that it's such the, the network of friends that you meet the network of just professors alumni that you get 
if you just try and do everything on your own, which I was very close to doing myself, I would never have met half the people that have helped me so much with what I'm doing. And, you know, I don't particularly think the teaching is amazing sometimes that I get. I get very frustrated sometimes that I feel like my tutors are a bit a bit rubbish. But at the end of the day, <coughs> at the end of the day, like, it's it's just such an important experience, I think, for you to develop key life skills that you wouldn't really get elsewhere. And it teaches you how to be, like, how to be self-sufficient. It teaches you how to research yourself. It teach A lot of people, like, I know if I was speaking to my just turned 18 year old self he'd like i would be arguing myself right now he'd be like no i know everything i know everything but the people that the smartest people in the world are the people that know they don't really know much at all you need to try these things out and if it's not for you fair enough drop out but i would always like my friends that weren't going to go i've basically forced them to go and they love it now amazing so you know it's just one of those things that like although i kind of do wish i could drop out i also really appreciate the benefit enjoy of enjoy it mate there. because it yeah. will fly before you know it and you'll be like not that you you know you look back and you're sad that you're not there now but you know i certainly look back at it with very very fond memories the friends that i've got out of it you know we've discussed uni in length haven't we josh um but no i think as you say situational in terms of the amount of knowledge that you've got from uni and then the amount of knowledge that you've acquired outside, if you could, like, this is quite difficult, but, like, if you could put a percentage on it, would you say it's, like, more knowledge from uni or more knowledge from outside of uni? I, I think it, it rather than being um, competitive, I think it's more, um, like, they build on each other. Okay. So, like, I'll have learned a lot myself um, and, you know, I'll learn... I'll learn it in practice, which I think is a lot more valuable than learning from a book. Mm. But sometimes learning it from a book, you have, you're given case studies of other people that have done certain things and they've tried certain things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get from just doing it yourself and learning. Like, you know, if you make a mistake, okay, you know, you can work around and learn how to fix it. But if you're told how other people have fixed the mistake, which you get through a degree mainly, um, like, I, I think that's kind of where they come together and it's really important. So I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I, I'd always personally say just because I'm arrogant, I'd say, yeah, I know it all myself, you know, but <laughs> but definitely like um, I'd say it, it's it's a massive combination of the two. How do you deal with the dichotomy of like saying to your friends, you should go to uni and then you going, oh, I'm thinking about dropping out or like I really or like unless my mum was like, like you really must stay in. Like you probably would have honestly, if it had just been your decision, you probably would have dropped out. Would you? Would you? Yeah. Or, yeah. How well, do that, you deal with? How would you do with that? Oh, okay. So one of my friends did drop out uh, recently, but he changed to another university and he's loving it there. So there like that's I I think there's a difference between dropping out and not going to university, yeah, and just dropping out and just doing your own thing. Like, so the reason that I would like I get that it, it may sound hypocritical, but I think university, if you don't really know like exactly what you want to do in life, university at least. Even if you don't find it there, at least you're having fun for years, you know. Like, I always knew that I was going to be doing this. And I, you know, as much as university has helped me, I kind of have grown to a point now where I do want to... I think I'm just so hungry that I to do it in there. Like, I don't... Uni isn't really holding me back that much. I'm just so hungry to put all my time into it. And my friends that I was kind of pushing into university... Well, not pushing them in, but, you know, like, really recommending they go. Um, they hadn't really quite worked out what they wanted to do yet. And it was like, you know... I just wanted to make sure they had an opportunity to fully experience different things, different people's like different backgrounds, you know, different, you know, sports even. Um, so I'd say that's, that's, yeah, that's kind of how I justify my hypocrisy. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that go to uni and don't know necessarily what they want to do, but then does that mean that you should miss out on what can be a fabulous three years? So for those people, I'm like, pick something you enjoy and that will provide some kind of broad utility later in life. That's, that would be my advice. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think that's like, yeah, like there's so there's so many things. Like there are look, there are there are degrees that are relatively useless. Um, I'm not gonna name any of them. <laughs> yeah, let's get the uh, list. Did a couple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's do a, a segment. What degrees are shit? <laughs> no, um, like yeah. So, but there are many degrees that are very transferable and are very totally. enjoyable to study. So, you know, like I kind of wish I did a psychology degree because I've Me always too. been super interested in psychology, like since I was little. And I find myself when I'm doing my elective modules, I pretty much always steer towards consumer psychology based ones or all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think my, my brother's just going into a psychology degree next year. So we'll, nice. see, we'll see the difference. Yeah. 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 Right.
Uh, let's do it from your perspective. You're creative. You your energy is actually coming from design, from producing clothing, that sort of thing. Like I wouldn't necessarily say your passion is the business side. Correct me if I'm wrong. So this is a question that um when I was younger, my granddad always used to say to me, like, when you get interviewed one day, people are gonna ask you, are you more of a business person or a fashion designer? Yeah. Uh and I genuinely I have been thinking about it a lot and I think I'm more of a business person. Really? Yeah, like oh. the reason I did business is because I've always had such a passion for the business. I I love marketing. I love yeah. finding ways to give people value, but also, you know, ways to get people to spend their hard-earned money on something you've made i think it's just so interesting yeah. but fashion the reason i didn't do anything creative is because i kind of felt like that was more innate to me uh when i went into uni i was like okay like i've got a very artistic family like i, I i've always liked art like if i should the business side of things that's what i need to develop that's myself to learn. but i've now kind of realized that I, I i wish i did a fashion degree now or an art degree uh, if I could change, um, I say psychology, but like, I like, I mean, <clears throat> art would probably be like right now, if someone said, right, you can change the last three years, it would be art or, or fashion. Why didn't, but what about if you just ripped up the system and your degree wasn't one of those things? It could be multiple. Like you could do uh, an art module. You could do a psychology module. You could do a business module. module. Would you do that? Um, I can do that. And I don't specifically because I would rather specialize in something. Okay. Um, and then you know, then learn the rest of it myself. Um, I, I don't want to like, if I've got the opportunity to develop one skill, I'll develop it completely fully. Um, and then I'll eventually come around to building the other ones, you know, when I feel like I need to. But so much of business, art and psychology these days are so linked. Like take for, take for example, like a like a, an advert for a, like, like on a poster. You know, you've got the psychology behind the uh, the copywriting, the text, you know, like the, the way the images are placed. You've got the art, the design of the actual poster and the business side is all the product that you're promoting. So like it all it's all very intertwined and it's a lot of crossover in my degree anyway with that kind of stuff. So that yeah. could be a new degree, art psychology business, I think. A nice like PPE they do at Oxford, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? The, the new PPE, the modern the modern day PPE, let's call it. Yeah. Um, you know, as a business owner as well, you're expected to have you know, have probably breadth as well as depth, aren't you? So as much as I agree in specialising, I think sometimes you can go too far down the rabbit hole with stuff that you just end up never using in mm -hmm. real life. I know a lot of people that say, oh, I did all this stuff at uni and I never use it. I think that's a common thing people say. So I would argue for um, not always depth, but, you know, if you want to be the best graphic designer in the world, then, yeah, you can have to spend a lot of time on Photoshop. So yeah. there's a balance. How have you acquired knowledge outside of like a formal setting? Like, uh, like you've mentioned YouTube tutorials. Have you done any other thing? Like, have you done Skillshare? Have you done like, have you had mentoring? Like, ha is there anything else that you? So I'd say one of the most valuable things I've I had as part of getting the uh, scholarship to university for River God, I got access to a mentor that I've become very close with who's been in the venture capital industry for years. And straight away, he got me the contacts of lawyers to incorporate the company, to help me with trademarks. He, he, he basically taught me how to take an idea, like a creative, ambitious idea and sort of make it real. You know, like what's too ambitious or like what's very ambitious, but can be done in a different way sort of thing. Like he's been very good at helping me sort of vet and understand that way of thinking uh, in terms of like actual content stuff, like in terms of rather than mindset uh, books, books are good. I recommend The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. It's a very famous book. Uh, a bit of a weird one, but if you're looking to start your own company in today's age, it's a book called Sell Like Crazy by Sabri Subi or something. Sabri Subi. That's been really good. I just gave that to a mate and he's loving it. Um, a lot of articles, magazines, like fashion magazines. Like, I don't know. I, I watch a lot of lectures on YouTube, like Virgil Abloh, like TED Talks, keynote speeches, like kind of just wherever I can find information, I would try and find it. Like... There's a really good marketer called, I think he's called Rory Sutherland, something like that. Um, he's He does like keynotes on consumer psychology and marketing. So interesting, like so valuable. And I've never heard his name come up in my degree, which really surprises me because apparently he's really famous, but I don't know. Like I can't even remember his name, <laughs> but but I've watched a load of his stuff and it's really interesting. I think every, I think everyone that goes into business should understand, have a basic understanding of psychology. We'll have to uh, get his days. name and we'll, um, I'd definitely love to watch those. Yeah, they're really interesting. Yeah, yeah. You um, mentioned your mentor as a venture capitalist. Um, have you ever considered taking investment? Ooh, 
this is a, I'm this, sure this you're is a big taught, question. I'm probably sure you're probably taught about it at university as well. And I don't know what you, you know, what you No, I know a lot do. about um, about venture financing, uh, whether it's angel investment, whether it's venture capital crowdfunding, all this sort of stuff. And at first, that was my plan. Um, but now I've kind of realized I can develop, like find my own money and kind of do my own way. I've realized just how much I love the full ownership of the brand. And I think that's such a big motivator for me. Uh, is that I know that if I keep building and keep building, keep building, it's something that I can pass on to my kids. Totally. Like, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't, f- I, I feel like the growth of the brand would be stifled by giving away control at this point because it's all me, it's in full control. I can pivot, I can change, I can, like, like if I just have an idea, I can completely change it. If I've got an investor, I have to run it by them. And then, yep. you know, and like, as I said, money isn't really something that fulfills me that much. Like, I, I grew up with very little and as soon as I had money, it didn't make any difference to me. Um, You know, like, I, I, it just didn't so for me it's the it's the ability to create and i know how to operate the business and you know my my side hustles to always have the ability to create with the brand so investment although it would be like amazing to get like you know a few hundred grand thrown at it and i've had offers um i've been offered 50 grand once um for some some uh some shares in the business but wow no who what would be who or who what type of person would be the first person that you'd employ if you were to take investment um so this is a difficult one because like i'm really bad at delegating and i've tried doing internships <laughs> like... with people like i'm yeah i'm so bad at it like i'm i'm so tunnel visioned and I, I i always say to myself that anything that anyone else could do for me the amount of time it would take them to teach how to do it yeah. in my way like i could just do it myself um and that's not out of arrogance that's just out of being impatient like yeah. i really am impatient with all this stuff but I was thinking about this on the way here, actually, like just about the future of the brand and everything. Um, one day, I'm 100% going to have an artistic director. So someone that I give my vision to creatively and they can turn it into art. Because I've designed for so many brands myself. That means there's so many brands that have my ability out there. I don't want to be the same as these brands. I want to sure. be better. And I know that I'm not that amazing. I know I'm, I've got like a good amount, like level of design, but some artists these days are just absolutely incredible. Like I feel like me like with my ideas teamed up with like a really really talented artist is it would be killer like it'd be it'd be brilliant but i would like to work have some more people kind of on the pr front um in terms of the brand uh like connecting it to publications um influencers just just be doing that myself because it's so difficult to try and keep up with um so i suppose that and just oh definitely an accountant i hate accountancy (laughs) Wow. So bad. It's annoying because it's my best grade I've, I've had at uni. Like out of like 16 <laughs> modules, it's been my the highest by far, but I just hate doing it. So an accountant actually, first on the list. That's, nice. on, that's on my Christmas wish list. Wow. <laughs> so you're accountant. doing all your own books at the minute, are you? Nice. nice. Yeah. Talk yeah. about stifling creativity. That's probably one of the worst things oh, you could yeah. possibly, possibly do. Yeah, man, I hate it. It's so dry and so boring, but it's so necessary, you know, like because it's a limited company, I nearly got fined by the government <laughs> because I, I submitted my accounts three months late because I just couldn't be asked to do them. Uh, and that was a bit of a lesson. I was like, right, like, grow up. Yeah. Like, you know, you you know, you know, need to do this. Especially because they give you, like, what, 20 months after the first <laughs> year as well? Yeah. <laughs> so I, had like... About, I had, like, 10 letters cover in the post. So I was like, oh, I'll just do it tomorrow. So but yeah. I just kept forgetting. And then it's I got such, to the point. Yeah. It is a boring, boring task doing your end of year books and your uh, balance sheets and your profit and loss good exercise to do mm. for just to learn but just do it once and then hopefully be rich enough to just give it to an account so mate i think what would be good is if we go back and sort of like talk about river god itself mm-hmm. um what would you say the one the point of difference is with river god and two just explain to people that don't know anything about the brand like what you create so i'll go with what i'm creating uh first so river god like kind of the 20 second pitch is that it's like a UK made um, or partially UK made luxury sustainable streetwear label uh, that focuses on, you know, actually having meanings behind the designs and actually, you know, contributing to more important causes. Like I've got a, some patches, these patches I'm wearing now, they're coming out in a couple of weeks with half the profits going to cancer research. Like it's a, it's a very purpose driven brand. Um, the kind of USP product wise that I do right now are my switch patch hoodies which are done on very high quality um, luxury cotton, uh, organic cotton, uh, with Velcro slots you can swap out and customize with six other sets I've currently got out, soon to be seven. So essentially you can wear, I use the strap line, wear it your way, because you can wear you know, the same hoodie as your mate, but you're both wearing different patches in different color shoes, different trousers, but you know, essentially it's still the same hoodie. 
So that's kind of what I do product product wise. I mean, I do like I've got some caps out at the moment um, and t shirts mainly. But in terms of what I would say differentiates me as a brand, so there's one thing that I'm fully committed to with River God, and it's always trying to innovate what's currently out there. Like I don't want to just be another brand. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but they just do the same thing every season. They release trendy graphics, like big, like like trendy print styles, all this sort of stuff. Like the thing about River God is that it's never supposed to be about, um, you know, keeping up with trends. It's it's defining its own style. And you know, I design my clothes because I want to have them. You know, I don't design them to fit a certain season. So if you're buying into River God, you're buying into essentially a timeless piece it's not attached to a certain era or a certain trend it's just made because it's good and the aesthetic is clear um like i, I would say sustainability but sustainability isn't a usp anymore uh, as it shouldn't be it should be common practice um but all the products are made with you know living wage workers uh so there's no cruelty and everyone's being paid properly in the supply chains very very high quality organic materials and for my prints my first collection i wasn't able to access them for the the heritage collection annoyingly but for the first collection, I used um, water-based inks. So what these do, they actually dye the designs into the garments after a wash. When you wash the garment, it dyes the design into them. So it, it cracks you know, far less easier than it does with just standard screen printing. Mm. And with screen printing, like standard plastisol um, inks, there's so much pollutants that get sent out to like local water sources of uh, communities in like East Asia and third world countries that... You know, if I was to do a T-shirt where I knew that was happening because I wanted to put a cool print on a T-shirt, like, I just, well, I, I don't know. I don't even know. I, I couldn't do that. Like, physically, I, was like, I just feel so guilty. So, you know, there's no pollutants with these because it's all, it's all water-based. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's that's kind of what I'm doing product-wise. It's a bit different. Um, but essentially, yeah, it's just about the commitment to constantly innovate and try and bring new things to the market. Um, while also... Positioning myself as a place where you get value through education and can reach out to the owner, can reach out to me and, and I will help uh, build the brand. And there's a few things I'll tell you guys off camera for the next collection, the way I'm structuring it. And that's really going to be what, when people see what River God can be in the market and how mm. it's different to other brands. Mm. Can't give away the ideas yet because they will be stolen. Because um, <laughs> I, I really, really believe in these. Like, the, the ideas that right now that are popping that, I've, I, I, that I do, they're ideas I've had when I was like 17. Like I'm 20 now. I've nearly finished a degree i've done a year of this in practice like my ideas are far better and far more refined than they were when i was younger um but yeah i can't give this out yet because they're too good <laughs> so go back to these patches right mm -hmm. the the patches have been something of a sort of uh a renaissance a little bit for you in that it's something incredibly different no one else i, I don't know anyone else doing it i don't know if you do i get told a lot oh this brand does it and what they do it's like a supreme box logo hoodie but it's like their logo instead, and then you can swap it out for a different color, and that's it. And what I say to these people, you know, it's like comparing. So what I'm doing is, you know, each season there's new ones to update an old hoodie. It's about preserving the hoodie. It's about offering customizability to the hoodie at the same time. But a consistent, like, you know, like it's not like a gimmick that just dies after a season. It's something I'm committed to keep bringing out in the future and keep adding to. Each set is it isn't just like one like little box. It's three that are cohesively designed together to look like good like thematically and they're designed with meanings behind them that tie to the wider collection that are related to the t-shirts so when you know what well, the patches are you know the t-shirts you know i'm so bad at articulating but you know what i mean like it, it's a lot deeper than just putting velcro on a hoodie that's what i try to say to people it's about offering an alternative to seasonal you know having to buy a new hoodie each season like every other brand will want you buying their hoodies each season I consider this a bit like the Patagonia campaign, you know, don't buy this jacket. It's like, don't buy another hoodie next season if you've already got one and it's lasting as it should. You know, just keep buying the patches. It's, it's a way of reducing the ridiculous amount of clothes that go to landfill these days. Mm. So like, while I understand that, you know, people will always want to comment, bro, just put Velcro on a hoodie with a skull emoji for a few likes on a TikTok <laughs> comment. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I believe it's a lot more than that. I believe you know, comparing to the brands that just have like a logo that you can swap out for another logo, I'd say like it's comparing a, a Nokia to an i like a Nokia brick to an iPhone because they've both got the same function, of course, you know, like the calling and the swapping out. But the iPhone, you know, it allows for more creativity, it allows for updates, it allows for, for you to be able to change things over time, whereas the Nokia brick kind of always just the same as what, it's, what it is. And I'd love to see brands copy that. I, there was a 
there's a big brand in the UK that their owner that I follow, he posted a teaser of him copying me essentially on a jacket that got deleted very quickly afterwards. Uh, and I've not seen the release. This is a long time ago. Um, but I'd like to see more people do this or like find other ways to like give people the tools to upcycle their clothes and keep them fresh. Like, you know, like Prada, not Prada, Zara and H&M are doing these things now where you can give them your old clothes and they'll like either fix it or exchange or whatever. But I, I think that's, I don't. Th- I think it's a bit of greenwashing, to be honest. I don't think it's really yeah. going to make much of a difference. So yeah, you've got yeah. to have faith that the item that you buy and you know probably spend a little bit more money on will last you three to five years, as opposed to the one year that people are generally used to these days. So it's giving people that faith, and I don't know how you do that without promising. And I guess, well, I guess you give them a refund if it's if it's bollocks. If after a year your hoodie is all faded and what's the rest of it, I think that's how you could be true to it. Yeah, it's a difficult thing because obviously I only had around like six months of testing the samples before they, because I'd worked doing reselling for years of vintage pieces. I knew what made a piece last for a long time. You know, I knew the, the when checking the size tags and checking the wash tags of things, when they had like, when they were 30 years old, but still felt good, you know, I know what it was about those hoodies that made them last that long. So with mine, like the quality and the density is so well you know it's so high end for the price point like you will not find this quality at this price point i intentionally make sure it's at this price point i should be charging a lot more for these hoodies but i'm a startup i don't want to you know crowd out the market you know crowd out my uh, customers but yeah it's difficult because that's why i'm trying to release these new patches soon is to give people the belief that it's gonna it is something that's gonna change like i've seen people comment on my videos like i love like the idea but i don't want to buy into it until i've seen there's more proof that it actually will be a long-term thing and you know i know myself it will be but i can completely get the apprehension from other people yeah. and it's it's, a, it's all a work in progress you know like the patches i'm gonna actually start changing the way that i have them produced and manufactured like slightly different materials and stuff just because i want to keep innovating and keep improving like it's a continuous process of improvement what i'm trying to do with this is not just like here's the concept you have to wear it in 10 years yeah. it's like in 10 years it'll be better than it is now but you'll still be able to wear that hoodie Nice. And I'll find new ways around it. There'll be like collector's items one day. Maybe people will be trading them like Pokemon cards. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I actually had the idea originally. I was going to do the um, patches in like in like fake like trading card packets okay. that I was going to design for the brand. Because like I used to love like match tax, as I said. That's kind of what started me designing. But because I knew the price points were high for a startup, I was like, no, I'm going to just focus on like luxury sure. different packaging later on. I'll do like some gimmicky ones that or like like some collaboration ones with some people that we've done. Like maybe that's an idea. I, I've never really been much of an anime or Pokemon guy myself, but I know how massive those communities are. It'd be cool to do a collaboration with Pokemon one yeah. day where we do it in Pokemon packets. You know, there's an idea. That'd be really cool. Yeah, Would you collaborate awesome. with any other brands on patches? Like if, if another brand came to you and a massive brand that you follow, you've made a video, a documentary video about, would you countenance something like that? Would you do it? Yeah, of course. I'd love to. These guys are my idols, um, a lot of them, and would be awesome to have them kind of come and do their thing on my concept, my sort of, you know, it, like thing I'm putting out to the world. I wouldn't say there's anyone specific because the patches are kind of done in a way that it's like they're kind of blank canvases for anyone to put their own spin on. Like I'd love for people to make their own ones. I wanted, I'm going to do competitions in the future where people have to design their own ones and send them in and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, the patches I think is a great way of collaborating. It's going to be a big thing with music artists as well. Like I want to do like collaborations with artists for the patches like that that was one of my original pitch for the scholarship was just the the amount of freedom it gave for collaboration and how easy it is to do a collaboration like these can get made in 10 days in the uk sampling takes a week you know if you're doing like a collection of hoodies and t-shirts it takes ages to get all the, all the designs and all the sampling done so i have had collaborations with some people lined up but again i'm not at the point just yet where i feel like it's the right move just yet but in the future 100 percent. yeah yeah so um, I think what I am really interested in is to sort of look at River God and sort of go sort of like a very quick timeline and mm-hmm. go like from the very start to now, what are the steps that you've done? So like you've had uh, X amount of collections, when did they drop, you know, and then looking at the, the next sort of six months, what is going to happen? So I first started designing in 2018. Um I was sampling myself like I was sampling with manufacturers in China and eventually decided to do the identity collection where it was all about my own identity in the designs and my own design like style. That came out September 2021. I did the party to launch it. Box Park pop up a month later. Uh, 
kind of a bit I, I got the, the GQ feature in between these next two dates I'm going to say but it kind of slowed down around Christmas and January because I, I was running out of money for advertising and like you can't sell anything in January mm. so the brand kind of went a bit stale I was still pushing but I didn't really know what direction to go in like I was kind of a bit lost you know um, so I, I, I was I wasn't doing the best mentally at the time like it wasn't anything deep it was just seasonal sure. you know like and just stuff not going quite right so I came back with the heritage capsule, which I'll explain. I'd like to explain next what the whole point of the heritage thing is. Um, that's not necessarily like a collection that's supposed to be like with identity. It's sure. just it's kind of the same thing, but I'll explain later. So that came out in April. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I did the pop up where we met for the first time. Uh, where I released those, and I believe you got one of the heritage I do. pieces. Yeah, I, do. I wore it in the last podcast. So you'll see that <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you know, I that's when those came out, and then I got into TikTok and things just started going crazy in terms of you know getting recognized when i was out like selling like it was ridiculous like, i remember one morning i woke up and i'd gone i've had a whole I, i've been through a month where i've had no sales but i'm still paying back this loan so it like it hurts mm. uh there, I, there was a time in january where like my flatmates were giving me their ready meals they'd bought because i literally had no money in my account to even afford food i was so committed to getting this done but i remember waking up one morning in um in may and i had something like I woke up at like eight because I was already excited to get up to see what the sales were. But it was like a grand before I'd even woken up in sales. And I was like, oh, okay, we finally <laughs> we finally found something that's working here. Um, so then I released the Heritage Cap because I realized that a lot of people were complaining about the pricing. So I was like, I need a bit more of an entry-level product. So I released the Cap. They've sold relatively nicely, you know. Uh, they're more of the things like uh, my photography isn't great on those. Uh, but, you know, like they sell very well in person. That's why I find the T-shirts sell amazing in person not online really the hoodies don't sell in person but they sell really well online it's really weird so i'm trying to work out what it is that's doing that because there's obviously a reason um but i did that and then a summer just building i was working i had a big contract with another brand that will not be named uh because i can't name it for legal reasons but i had a big contract with that over summer which kind of took up a lot of time but i kept pushing out content for river god and i kept planning i did the anniversary party which went amazingly uh it was such a fun night i did like a pop-up there too so quite a bit um and then kind of from there, it's just been like, like the next step is these the Virgil Abloh tribute patches. And I'm going to try and release them on the anniversary of his death. Um, and for those of you, like I talk about him quite a lot in my own content. Like he genuinely was such an influence on my life. Like even though like, my dream was to meet him. It was always to keep pushing, keep grinding to meet Virgil Abloh and tell him how much I appreciated what I've learned from him. Because I've watched loads of his lectures. You know, I've read so many articles that he's done, so many interviews, like... I was a bit of a fanboy. Well, it's a bit of a fanboy. Yeah. I, wrote, I literally wrote a report about him when, like randomly when I was like 16 just because <laughs> I was bored, you know, like a 5,000 word report on him and his teachings about branding. So like these, he was the, he's the only death I've ever experienced, like I've actually cried about. I've been very lucky with my family um, that I've not um, had any, you know, close family deaths or anything. And celebrity deaths never really, never really get me. But because my dream was to work to the level of where he'd recognize my work and meet me, and suddenly it was gone. It's like it's like the whole thing, you know, that people say the greatest tragedy, you know, is is actually fulfilling what your, you know, what your goal is. Because when you've got that goal, what do you do then? Sure. And I didn't even have the chance to pursue that goal. So these patches are kind of me sort of putting his, they're inspired by his full Winter 20 collection for Louis Vuitton. It's my favorite yep. one that he's done for them. And it's kind of putting his work into my, style and my product the patches that you know i'm known as the patch guy at uni <laughs> so like uh but with 50 percent of profits going to cancer research charities yeah. and um you know i would love to do 100 percent, but viably like if if this goes well and i'm able to make profit from it the money will just be put aside for more uh, uh, like purpose-based patches more initiative-based patches you know it's not like i'm being like yeah i've made some money off of yeah. that like it's it's much more about reinvesting so that's where we're at now with the brands. And then obviously, as I mentioned uh, earlier, or maybe later, <laughs> depending on how this is edited, <laughs> um, uh, moving towards UK-based, uh, more like detailed and complicated pieces. Um, Can, that's the next step, sure. which is going to be a long process, but it'll be worth it. Are I you going to release like one thing at a time or have you got a whole collection that you want? Are you going to just do some trousers or jacket? or? Yeah, so I've started to realise now that... Um, it's so much easier releasing one product at a time because you can focus all your promotion into that. Sure. When I launched, I had no experience of really marketing and I was trying to sell like 15 products at the time, you know, like six sets of patches and like the, all the hoodies and t-shirts and everything. Like it, it was just, it wasn't viable uh, with the resource that I had. 
So if I do one piece at a time, it means I can focus all my energy into that piece on the design front and I can focus all the marketing communications onto it. And it keeps it exciting as well, I, I think. Like, rather than dumping everything in one go, it's like constantly waiting for what's the next thing going to be? Is it going to be a jacket? Is it going to be trousers? Is it going to be like a gilet? Is it going to be like a shirt? Like, I don't know, you know. So, like, I kind of want to just keep it, like, I, I'm going to be quite quiet about the pieces when I get to that stage. Like, very different to what I'm doing now with TikTok. It'll kind of be like, next week this is coming out. When I've spent, like, two months working on it, you know, like... But I'll keep up with the educational content instead to fill the for the feed. Mm -hmm. But it will be one piece at a time, um, at least for like maybe like six months a year, and nice. then yeah. I think um, something that we've been following quite closely on your socials is this story about selfridges, haven't we, mate? We have indeed, yeah. Yeah. So I think we should we should delve into that. We've got a million questions about about what's going on really <laughs> haven't we i think when we first met you at box park you were going to pop down to selfridges that day um yeah talk to us about your quest with selfridges what you think of selfridges and uh, how it's going so selfridges to me was a place that when i did work experience in london when i was a lot younger um when i was 17 i used to like i would be commuting every day from from oxford but i would go to selfridges every day for two weeks after my thing i was such a nerd for it i loved going i loved like all of the way that the shop was set up. I'd go in there, I'd take pictures of certain pieces I wanted to take inspiration from for River God. So like I would feel the fabrics, I'd learn how the fabrics work. I'd learn like where the manufacturers are, I'd check on their tags. Um, so like I would go there so much and I always have because it's just like being the place to I've used to learn. Because like there's no streetwear scene in Oxford. There's, there was never really any shops until a flannels opened a couple of years ago. It was kind of my only point of reference to really physically see these brands that I loved. So selfridges meant a lot to me in that sense and when it got to the point when i was like when i'd met you guys and i was like hold on like i actually have a really good quality product here and people are starting to see that and the, the notion that even having my products in this place that i was considered so like you know influential for me it was like this would be insane and i remember the day that we went like so yeah i'll, I'll give the i'll give the spoiler so the video i actually posted of going into selfridges that was actually me following up with them i I had done exactly what was in that video three months before, but it was before I did TikTok, so like I didn't, um, I didn't film it. But I knew that it's something that would people would want to know. Like I didn't want to just tell the story; I wanted to do it again. So I went in again and filmed it um, to make it look like. I, but I did, I did like, I did actually go around and say to them where it is. But the guy recognised me. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was like, "Oh, Alexia." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Yep, just back again." Um, so you know, like. So the day that we were going, um, my friend Joel, who's always a bit skeptical, like he's very supportive, but he always tries to be like, you know, um, like as realistic as possible with me. Um, and he'll love that name drop. <laughs> Hi, Joel. Um, Hello, Joel. What's his Instagram handle? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to give him. I'm not going to give him the clout. Um, <laughs> um, but he basically said to me, like, um, I, he said, what do you think the actual chances of Selfridges taking your product are tonight? And I was like, well, I have no idea, but probably like 3%, like I'm a new brand. I go in, we go in and I'm like, like shivering, like not shivering, like quivering. Um, I'm going in, I go up to the staff member and I, I just suddenly feel like, there's one thing in life, when I'm talking about the business and I'm talking about the brand, I kind of have something that takes over me. Like it's a, like when I'm pitching, for example, just a, a, a type of confidence that just overcomes me. And I said to this guy like, you know, who do I speak to about getting my brand in here? Like, and he said, uh, I don't really know. I've never really been asked that before. <laughs> like he said, people ask me, you know, about the clothes here, not getting their own in. And I was like, well, you know, I brought some samples with me. Um, I can show you. And he was like, okay, man, called another guy over who I'd met on, again on the second time I went. And uh, they were going through it with me and they were like, like, they're like, what? Like, how have you, did you just like, they said, they were, they were even impressed that I'd set a website up, you know? <laughs> Like, they were like, have you got a website? I said, yeah. And they said, oh, okay, wow, okay. They're like, they thought I'd literally just made these myself and brought them in. Like, yeah, I was yeah. like, no, this is a brand. But, yeah. like, I don't have a, a PR agency, like, that can, or, like, a marketing agency that has the contacts for you guys. Like, I've I've tried email, I've tried finding their buyers on, like, LinkedIn. <laughs> Nothing back ever. Really? So, like, I was like, you know, I'm just going to walk in and do it. Um, so, then they called the, the menswear manager down. Uh, he came down, was a very, he's quite just an interesting bloke. Um he had a look through my products and was like, yeah, the fact that they're sustainable, the price points are really good for the quality. Like, and they agreed stylistically it fit in very well with their collection at the time. So I was obviously just like, I couldn't believe what was going on. Like it was like a, such a ridiculous high at the time. 
Um, and I was like, so I left them the samples and they said, can we get your contact details, please? Um, to pass them to the buying team. And I was just like, oh my God, like this is actually happening. Um, and then anyway, we left and we walked around the corner and saw Mo Gilligan. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I was like, oh God, I, I'll just go and speak to him. Um, I said, you're, you're Mo Gilligan. Yeah. And he said, yeah, man, what's up? And I was like, oh, uh, well I have a t-shirt here. Would you like it? And I told him about that. He follows me. He follows the, he follows the River God account because like I gave him a t-shirt and he really liked it. Said he was going to buy a Switch patch and hasn't yet. So Mo, you know <laughs> what you're playing at, mate. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's kind of the reason I went was because I was told by one of my old design clients to go on a fried Friday before closing because um, that's when like all the celebrities go. And I saw Dappy, you know, the rapper. Oh, yeah. yeah, I saw him there, but I was like, I just... <laughs> no, not the right, not no. fit for the brand. Um, so yeah, so that was what happened on day one. Uh, but two of the guys wanted my personal um, WhatsApp because they wanted to keep in contact about the brand. They wanted to, you know, help any way they could. Um, I, I'm not sure whether to name drop them because like I don't know if it'll get them any trouble for what they've been saying yeah, to yeah. me but um they've kind of given me a lot of inside information about how it all works which you know they're probably allowed to do but like I don't want to get them any trouble but they are top top guys um but the next day one of them posted a picture on his Instagram story with um the other guy wearing River God in Selfridges and tagged Selfridges nice. in the story and then he always comments like he always tags them in my post and like I'm doing like Instagram like whether it's my personal or it's my my uh, River God account and he, I get, he came to the pop up a few days later, spent like two hundred and fifty quid on stuff himself, and I was like, "Do you want it? Just want it for free?" And he said, "No, no, no, I genuinely really like this brand." Like, and he came in wearing like Heron Preston, Off White, and Miri, and I was like, "Wow, this guy's just dropping this much on my brand, you know?" And he stood there for me for like an hour, um, like in the shop, just watching how I interacted with people, uh, and it was like pure luck but as he came in the shop got the busiest it had ever been like it was just full of people and one of my old design clients like like came as well like i must have met loads of them at the pop they always come through all the london people and he came to me and was like man like thank you so much for what you've done for me like all this sort of stuff he's like river god is it's so it's so good seeing how it's developed and how fast it's growing and then i've just got this guy here just like the selfish guy just <laughs> filming it i'm like yeah yeah keep going yeah, keep going. <laughs> yeah. um so yeah, so he he got this stuff, um, and we stayed in contact, very close contact. And like, whenever I'd release anything new, I'd I'd give it to him. Like, I just sent it to him in the post, and like, he wears the the heritage cap that I do like all the time to work. But he started saying that he he'd speak to the buyers every time he could. Like, you know, why are you not in contact with him yet? Like, what, like why are you not speaking to him? Uh, like, he'd wear my stuff to work. Um, and it got to the point where I was like, what more can I even do? Like, I've gone in twice. Um, the staff. And the managers said they love it. The buyers like to feel like they're the ones that have discovered the brands. Um, there is a bit of an ego to that job. Okay. Um, and I have nothing against it. I completely, I would be the same in that job. Like I'd want to, you know, that's where the fulfillment of the job comes from is that you've discovered the brands yourself. So when you've got loads of people telling you like, we, you know, like stock this brand, it, it's probably a bit frustrating. Um, so, you know, it, it, even though like he told, like I've, I've been told by these two guys that in Selfridges, the sales assistants are actually valued for their opinion because they're speaking to customers on a day-to-day. -day. They know what customers want. And I thought, you know, I've done everything I can in, on my end. I've sent loads of emails off. I've got staff in there wearing it. What's the one thing I'm missing? And that's the customer demand. Because, like, I mean, maybe there were people asking for God's in there, yeah, because I know it's it's something that people want to see in person because I always talk about the quality. People can't really see it in person because I only do pop-ups. Maybe they have been asking anyway. But I thought, you know what, like, the platform has been growing very fast. Um, it's about time that I try and utilize that for something. So I did the campaign where if people go in and film themselves asking for River God in a respectful manner, you know, I'm not about trying to piss the staff <laughs> off or be rude um, or like hold the camera up like, hey, do you stop River God? Because obviously that would yeah. give the game away. Of course. Um, but the plan is, yeah, to get as many people in there saying like, do you stop River God? But I had to change it because I spoke to one of the assistants in there about the idea, which is why I can't name them. Okay. And he gave me some advice. He said he loved the idea and thinks like, yeah, this is going to work. Like, but you need to try and focus more of the energy towards management rather than store assistance, which makes sense. It just it just makes the process a lot faster. Um, and it, like, instead of having to have like five five people ask one assistant to make the assistant tell the manager, it's just five people going to the manager straight away. So I've changed it now. And if you film yourself going in saying, "Have you got Rivergod yet?" to a manager, or like, "When are you when are you stocking Rivergod?" Um, DM me, you get a free 70 quid t-shirt for my first collection. So far, I think like 15, 20 people have done it. Uh, there's one guy that made it into like a little production. Like it was really funny. Like he made it like, like with like intense music and like a build up. That was so funny. <laughs> um, but like that's, it's, yeah. I mean, from a business point of view,
Selfridges wouldn't necessarily be that like amazing. Like I've spoken to other brands and just through like connections I know in the industry that I've built over the last few years. Getting a brand in Selfridges isn't necessarily about profit. It's much more about real estate. It's about being alongside these brands. It's being in Oxford Street. It's being present. It's not about the margins are quite crap um, on wholesale, um, especially with the way I do it because my retail prices, I take a cut shorter margin than I should anyway to, you know, to grow the brand. So like for me, it really wouldn't the the one thing in terms of the business side that would be good about Selfridges for me is that let's say I want to do a collection of jackets that are really expensive to make. If I can make a sample of them and prove to Selfridges that it's worth producing, they will fund the production for me. Um, and I'll say it's a Selfridges exclusive, but it's just so I can get the product into the world. That's kind of the biggest thing. But the Selfridges thing, I, now that I've realized that I'm growing a platform and I'm able to inspire and influence people, well, I say influence, influence them to buy my clothes, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but you know, now I'm able to actually have an impact on, on things. Um, I realized that if I get into Selfridges as some at the time 19 year old guy walking in with his product that he built from his council estate bedroom you know um if i can do that and have selfridges use their money on my brand over a brand like gucci or any other big brand i think that's a great sort of start for what the fashion industry should become is appreciating more independent people and pushing more people to to really believe in themselves enough to go in to literally the biggest fashion shop in the whole of the uk and be like, yeah, you should buy my stuff. It's just as good as these. Just I haven't got my name yet, so help me get my name. You know, it's it's frustrating because, you know, I've had people tell me like, oh, it's such a stupid idea. But it's like, no, I, it's really more than just like, I, I don't need Selfridges. I don't need them. Like I'm growing, the sales are, are very good organically and they, you know, and the margins are much higher. So like, it's much more that's what i'm really hoping to do now is that like any like if i had seen as a 15 year old kid who was desperate to do his own brand some 19 year old a little bit older than me walking into selfridges showing them his products and it worked like i would have just been like completely mind blown so that's what i want to do i want it to be like a look what we look people power you can be you don't have to have a big fancy agency you don't have to have all these all these resources all these networks you go out there you get it yourself and i'm trying to prove it that's like the most clear way of proving it, i believe is the physical stocking of my product so that's kind of like the big motive for me now to get it in there and that's you know and using people power using people going in and you know it shows people like people feel part of the journey people yeah. feel part of the history history of it all so yeah it's a, it's a weird campaign <laughs> i can't lie <laughs> It is a bit random, but like, why not? When you told me, like Alexi told us when we met you in the pop-up, when you told me, I honestly thought this is insane. Like there's no way that this can work. Not not to discredit you, just because like I just thought these guys are going to be super pretentious. There's no way they're going to listen to anyone, regardless of their age, going into a shop. Like, like you said, I would think the buyers are very protective and all of those sort of things. So if this actually works out what a story to tell mm. like i'm sure a lot of people will be coming from it from the same perspective where they're like there's no way you can get into this into this store well that, that's the reason why i didn't post it first when i actually did it because i thought shit if i post it and then someone else does it like if everyone else starts doing it then like it completely discredits what i've done yeah so i wanted to have at least a few months in there with them knowing about what i was doing and sort of familiarizing themselves before because obviously there's going to be other people that do this i saw this video actually that i loved and it was annoying because i hadn't thought of doing it myself i know it was an idea i had a long time ago but kind of forgot about um but these guys did it a lot better than i would have done it anyway so i can't remember the brand name but it came up on my for you page it was two guys that went to dover street market which is another one of like it was kind of like selfridges and dover street market for me they were like the two big ones mm. and they just went in with wearing one of their hoodies and just took it off and put it on one of the rails <laughs> now I, I was going to do this with my next collection it's like okay i can tell you about the idea now because I've, I've canceled the idea yeah um so one of my ideas was <laughs> this is so stupid and illegal um that's the problem with the next collection disruption some of the marketing stunts are borderline illegal okay. so there's going to be a lot of lawyers involved before i do any of them some some of them that are still potentially happening oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah this one was just like too stupid okay, okay. so what i was going to do um you can buy like Selfridges hangers off eBay. They're like a few quid. Just They're just sold sure. as like excess stock so it doesn't go to landfill. My plan was, this is when I've got enough of a following, basically release it like a month before I publicly release the t-shirts. Be like, all right, come to Selfridges in Oxford Street, 2 to 3 p.m. this day. Um, and I'd go in there with my portable card readers who's at the pop-up, 
go to the streetwear section, hang out the Rivergore t-shirts in there, sell them from there before anyone else can actually access them, and then go to Selfridges and say, look, I've sold this much in an hour of my product. Imagine if you had it <laughs> yeah. here full time. Now, that was an idea I had when I, when I was like, when I had no Wi-Fi at my house. <laughs> I <was just> bored. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And thinking about it, that is just so stupid. Like, yeah. it could like it could be like a funny, like, you know, it's more about the content yeah. and getting it pushed out there. But like, mm. that would just get yeah, me into too much shit. Legally selling on someone else's premises. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> Good that's, luck that's, with that that's why I didn't do it. Because <laughs> it is genuinely illegal. So yeah, that's kind of the missions at the moment. But the next, the next collection, Disruption, which I'm not sure when we'll be out yet. But that's all about like really making a statement to the to the industry like using enough of what i've learned from how to gain attention for the brand what other brands have done but in my own way uh and i'll tell you guys off camera these ideas but yeah like Can't wait to hear them, to be honest with you. okay so they're, they're legal i think <laughs> <laughs> we've got to consult the lawyers before we yeah, confirm or deny yeah. whether they're legal or not yeah i mean um do you believe in the power of like guerrilla marketing like I, I know the the one that i really wanted to chat to you about is cortese because mm -hmm. you did a video about it recently it's obviously gone absolutely crazy the 99p cargo store like one what first of all what's your opinion of it i love it yeah. i think in this day and age guerrilla marketing is absolutely the way and i'll explain why so let's use for exa for the for the 99p cargos let's say he spent 10 grand on stock which he wouldn't have done but let's just say he did i mean maybe he did but so let's say each pair of cargos cost 30 quid to make so that's what 330 pairs of cargos um the amount of people so that's 330 people having a walking advertisement for his brand for very very cheap it's thousands of people on the streets of london running around and the TikToks have been going viral of them. Mm. If you were to use that £10,000 on paid adverts that people just skip through, people don't want to see, yeah. people use ad blockers for, you wouldn't get even the reach that yeah. you would with this, with a guerrilla campaign like that. Like, that is pure genius. Like, I, I mean, I don't know. I assume he knew what he was doing with it. Like, I'm assuming he knew that when he was doing it. But that's the way I approach things now. Like, doing real life shit and balancing the cost between how much you would pay for a cold advert view versus using the money in something real and using the organic features because it's just and good harvesting stuff. the content as well exactly and he didn't even need to post half the content people were doing it for him yep. so I, I think genius people are like how is he making profit selling 99p cargos obviously not that's not what he's trying to do like he is a business person he's like oh, hmm, let's make these cheaper so people buy it and make it 30 <laughs> quid less than what he's making them for like it's so dumb but yeah, so that, I think it's a genius idea. I love it. I, I'm a big fan of Cortez's marketing. But I say marketing, not necessarily products. Okay, well, let's talk about the products then. What, like, what's the beef there? Like, so you, I, you said, it sounds like you've got a real problem with <laughs> Cortez. I've owned some of their pieces, right? Yeah. And they look cool. But I, don't, I just don't like the quality. The quality what's is just what's naff, wrong with them, man. Really? I've never had a hoodie or anything, but the T-shirts, the quality is just naff. They, they've they been, for the Central Sea Club, they use Gildan T-shirts and have the tags in. No. Which I think is just a kick in the face to, you know, like it's really, it's frustrating. I think it frustrates me more than a normal person because I'm trying to sell T-shirts for 60, 70 quid. People, you know, will cut off their right arm to get a 70 quid Cortez T-shirt off Depop or whatever. That when you put them next to each other, they're just crap. And after a few washes, and it was a real shirt, like it wasn't like a fake one or anything. And after a few washes, it started to pill a bit. It started to feel like a very fast fashion-y T-shirt. And it's like, man, you've got people, like, in your palm. Like, you could be doing something sustainable, something higher end, and you'd still sell it. It's a lot of money for people, a lot of hard-earned money, especially at the minute as well. Yeah, but you can be sustainable without having to spend that much money. Like, my my prices aren't as high as they are because they're sustainable. It's because of the quality of them. Like, the sustainability is just, like, a happy byproduct. If I was to factor in the sustainability cost, the hoodies would be up 150, the t-shirts would be 90. But I don't want to charge people for that. I'll take that as my own, like, you know, my own margin. Sure. Yeah. But Cortez, yeah, it's a really interesting brand. And what he's doing with it is awesome. Um, like, I, the guy is just so good at getting a movement behind what he's doing. Um, and it's something that I massively respect about him. Like, I, and a, a way that you can tell the brand is doing well is that you get people that comment, um, hate Cortez, but love Clint. Now you get people that like the designs too. Like that's just you're printing money at this point, man. Like I, I just think, yeah, I think it's very, very smart. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much of it, like, with these like campaigns he does. Like I would love to have a chat with him, like a proper chat, and understand like whether he knows what he's doing with them or he's genuinely just doing it because it's fun to do. Like I'm sure that there's a lot more to, like, 
you know what he's thinking than it is just about having fun but like i've worked with so many brand owners that would never even think like that um, and probably do something similar just because i think it's fun you totally. know and maybe there's ones that they've tried before but you've never heard about because they were unsuccessful there were other random ideas but you'd never see those ones and that might be the fifth idea that worked yeah that's a very good point um and because they don't do any sort of paid promotion or anything cortez you only hear about them through a successful pr stunt yeah. Um, and I'm sure like all the ones they have done have been right because he had a brand before called Cade on the Map which I'd like to um, uh, correct in my video I called his friend Aid Sanusi it's Arde Sanusi um, and I knew that that was going to be an ambiguous one so I've been caught out on that quite a bit but he, he had a brand called Cade on the Map um, which is like it looks like everyone's first brand <laughs> like you know what I mean like at some point most people have given a little go to designs and like they're cool stuff but like Cortez is just on a different level like mm. he Clearly, like that's kind of like I, I had that phase with it. So I originally had a brand called Imperium, which was just power in Latin. <laughs> like oh, I was God. a cool fifteen-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very Warhammer, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. was. I, I really, yeah, yeah, it was so dumb. Um, the designs were so uninspired. But I, I posted them to um, uh, the Supreme Facebook group chat, like like you know, the, the group. I don't know a page or something. I don't know how Facebook works, but I knew that's like. It was huge. So that's back when Facebook was really big for streetwear. I got about 300 comments of abuse when I was 15. Uh, like, I look back on them now, it's so funny. Like, some guys were just like, sorry, but this is fucking horrendous. But if you're dedicated, it will work, uh, which I have saved on my phone now. I have a little folder called Motivation where I save all the hate comments and all the really nice comments nice. so I can look at them. But and I changed it to theta, as in the Greek letter theta. Literally no reason. We ju- we're just studying it. Like, we're doing missing angles and theta and maths in year 11 and i was like oh, that sounds kind of cool mm. and then i did some designs that ended up looking very much like kenzo and that's like the joke back in oxford is that everyone kind of knew me as the guy that got clowned on for like ripping off kenzo it wasn't intentional i loved kenzo but it wasn't intentionally you know like a, a rip off i'm not i'm not going to go into the whole story but theta was a brand for a while and then after that i was just like damn like i hadn't even released anything thank fuck but i i made samples and done photo shoots and people were like just hating hating it and i was like right i remember getting really really upset about it at one point um i was in the back of my granddad's car and he's always been a big supporter of me doing something creative and me making my own way uh because he had to flee from scotland when he was younger um and really like completely build a life here himself so he's always had that mentality about him and he was very happy to see it in me but got really upset when I was like, I just don't think I can do this. Like, I don't. Maybe I'm just not a designer. Like, maybe it's, the market's too saturated. Like, I've done all this research about other brands. I'm like, how the hell am I getting people these? And he was like, No. Like, stop. Don't. You're talking crap. Don't give up. Like, you want this so badly. Um, and I was like, I know. But like, the only way I can break into the market is if I think of a way of doing a product that hasn't been done before. Like, I can't just do a hoodie. I can't just do a t-shirt. And I, I remember that I was just down the road from my house at this point, I was just getting really worked up and really saying, like, like, I was thinking, like, can I do, like, some kind of weird bag thing? Can I do some, like... And, like, you know, so I was really thinking, I know I can't break in and get the attention I want for the brand just doing cool T-shirts. And this was back in, like, 2017. So, like, brands are doing this five years on, like, five years later. Jeez, that's five years, isn't it? That's mental. <laughs> that's um, yeah, so... Then I was sort of talking with my granddad later on... Um, about my great granddad's military jacket that had the patches on that you'd swap out your ranking, and as soon as he was like, "Yeah, you'd swap it out and put another one," I was like, "Hold on, there's there's, there's something there's something I could really work with here for streetwear," and that's where the idea of the patches came from. Um, and the first mock-ups are really funny because like the patches are like that big, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it would be so impractical. And like people have said to me, "Why don't you do like a like?" I've had loads of people say that do like a massive one on the back. It's like, yeah, it's a cool idea. That's what I was about to say. Like, yeah, a back print would be sick. It would be sick. But, but this is the thing. What's the issue? How do you store it? Do you fold it and just crease the design on the back? Yeah. And how do I send them out to people? Like a big sheet? Like a poster. Of... Yeah. yeah, like, it, it just... Maybe in the future I could find a way of doing it. But right now, with the current way they're doing, it's it's like, it would just not work. And that's the bottom line. But I would love to do that. You I'd could love split to them up, though, couldn't you? You could do, like, four four quarters of a design or, like, two halves. Do you I, know what I mean? I think that could work with the new direction I'm working on the patches. So the patches now, with the border, and they're kind of, like, chunky. Yeah. I'm going to do a few where it's just, like, thinner fabric. So, like, uh, it's more wavy with the, the hoodie. Like, these are... um, 
yeah, they're quite rigid. I also wanted them to be like people don't like that. Some people don't like them. Some people do like it. But there was for them to be quite bold, so you'd recognise this as a river god, like the big mm. chunky sort of three D three D patches. But I'm moving more towards like you'd find like a sewn over patch on a like a jumper, for example. Um, and I feel like those would probably work better for a back print. Those probably would work fine for a back print. Um, but it'd be about costing as well. Mm. Like these are already quite expensive to make. The margins aren't like I, the, the idea behind these was like to have like a super high margin additional product. Like how, you know, Gillette, the Gillette model mm. where you buy the actual like raise, you know, you buy the handle and you yeah. buy the razors. That was the idea. But they actually ended up being the margins are not as strong as I first expected. They're good. They're like standard margins, but they're not that amazing. Mm. When I'm doing small batches like these, there's really not much profit margin to be made at all. Um, so the big patches would probably be very expensive to make. But if I can find a way of doing it in the future, I'd love to give it a go. Like that's what I mean. I'm always going to try and build on this idea. Like it's not just like, here's my idea. I'm going to do the exact same thing for 20 years. 10 years time, it's going to be very different. Um, but with also this as well, like there'll be more variations, more additions and like other ways of cut. Like I had this idea, I think other brands have done now as well, where you'd get a jacket or a hoodie. Uh, like, you know how that whole like Maharishi style is very popular at the moment with like all the like embroidered dragons and stuff like it would be like you'd have like a blank hoodie. This was this was before the patch idea and you'd have a zip like a hidden zip on the sleeve and you could get like a like a sleeve with like you know, like a red embroidery on it or like one with like a blue embroidery, but that wasn't really scalable as a business model. That was more of like a gimmicky one-off thing. So that was one of the earlier, that was one of the earlier iterations of the patches. Subjective, isn't it? And at the moment they're on uh, hoodies only, right? Yeah. Uh, they're on a sweatshirt though as well. Yeah. And so what about, what about t-shirts? Like, is that functionally possible? Is that something you want to do or? T-shirts it won't happen with. Uh, that was the, the, the original idea. But because the patches are quite, because you know, the i they're like a nice weight, a nice quality to them. They would just make the t-shirt sag unless the sure. t-shirt was like super heavyweight. And at the point that it would be like heavyweight enough, it'd basically be a hoodie or a sweatshirt, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not, I probably won't have, and I've had people say like, oh, like I'm going to try sewing onto a t-shirt. And it's like, cool, like give it a go. Like you've got your patches, you can do what you want with them. Mm -hmm. um, but personally from my tests, it would just look a bit funny. It wouldn't really sit quite right. And I, I prefer, I don't actually like, I don't wear, I like the odd heavyweight t-shirt, but I prefer with, with my designs because they're quite flowy and quite like vibrant. The first collections t-shirts are more lighter weight anyway. They're more of a sort of high, high thread cut run up. The fibers are very high in them. So it's very luxury quality, um, but it's not like heavyweight. Like that's something that's a misconception in fashion is just because it's heavy, it's, it's luxury. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't have worked at the time not but even with a a sort of lesser fabric patch as well well with, again with the new direction i'm tr the new direction i'm trying with these um that could potentially open the opportunity for t-shirts with them um i would have to see i will have to see um but jackets will be on one day people have been nagging at me to do some trousers with them on but i've not found a way to get them to sit on the trouser right yet again with the current style like these were very much built for the hoodie um, with different styles, I could probably do it quite easily with trousers, but, um, but yeah, like, like if it was to, cause your, cause your legs bend a lot more than your like torso does. Yeah. <laughs> Science fact. <laughs> 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 so like business degree, artist, psychologist, and now uh, biology major. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so like, yeah, it just wouldn't really work. Um, Got it. but I'm, I'm always, I'm always about experimenting and trying things. And like, whenever someone gives me an idea, it's not like a, like I, I did just say like no to you now, but that's not like I'm still going to be thinking about that idea. It's yeah, just like course. easier to just be like no. Yeah. But then like actually, then I'll come back a week later and be like, wait, actually, you know that could be done. Well, you need to try and make yeah. it work. Like you're saying, yeah. functionally, it's not necessarily possible now. There's no, there's no harm in sort of going. I'm going to try and see if it works in the future. You just don't know. You just don't know physically if it's possible. Yeah, I find that the, uh, there's one thing that I, I didn't really ever anticipate, um, but I love, and it's when people who know my work try to give me well I like give me like like ideas and recommendations for how I can better that whilst know my it's like really weird because it's always been so in my own head how I do these things and then having someone else who understands them the same way that I do also adding it's like it's just such I I love it like it's one yeah. of my favorite and I always want that with my customers to always feel like they can always have their say they can always give their recommendations and I'll at least give them a go I'll give them a thought like I'm never going to completely like like shit on an idea unless it is really bad do you want a shit idea right now 
Go on, let's, see, let's see how I react to it. So if you could hide the seams of garments, could you do like a T-shirt that you could turn inside out and have two T-shirts, two different designs? Yeah, no, reversible stuff is definitely something that I was looking into as well. Um, there's a really interesting piece that's just come out. Um, it's not a T-shirt, but in the same vein. Uh, the Montclair collaboration they're doing at the moment, the Rick Owens Montclair uh, jacket. Like, it looks like a standard, like, you know, the, the shiny bin bag Montclair jacket on the outside. <laughs> um, but, like, with the Rick Owens logo. I'm not, that's not me, like, shitting on it. Like, I love those yeah. jackets. It's just what they're that's known the as. the official product bin name. Back. No, is, is, it, is it not? Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but then you turn it inside out, and it looks like a kind of much more, like, windbreakery kind of jacket. Um, it's really interesting. Um, but it's two grand, so I'm not going to get one. <laughs> but they're well, very cool. It's one grand each, actually, for two yeah, jackets. Yeah, that's a good point, <laughs> Fine, yeah. Oh, it's fine. It's cheap. I just want to say, I think we've come to the end, mate. But thank you so much for um, for joining us. I think thank you for having me. Yeah. This podcast has been absolutely immense. We've talked for a crazy amount of time. I'm really <laughs> interested to see how long it actually ends up being. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I feel like, to be honest, mate, I feel like I've learned a crazy amount. So I'm really excited for people to watch it in full and uh, and learn some of the stuff that you've got to share because you've got a lot of knowledge. Well, I, yeah, I, I hope that people can get value out of this. I always struggle to really think about, um, you know, like I find it weird that people do get much value of what I have to say. Um, like when I've done talks and stuff before, it's very odd to me that people are like, wow, that was so interesting. Because to me, it's just like what's already in my head. But if it does provide value to people and people have learned something and people have just, you know, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah, they definitely, they definitely have me. So just so people are aware, you've got 20,000 followers. Let's add maybe two or three more. Uh, where can people find you on socials? And So my sort of biggest platform at the moment is my TikTok, which is at Alexi Hamblin, um, which, you know, you're sp hopefully you'll spell it correctly in the title. Oh, well. Everyone always gets it wrong. Oh, well. um, and then my uh, my Instagram for my brand is at rvgd.clo. Same as TikTok, but I don't really, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm very inconsistent with my platforms. Those are the two <laughs> that I use the most. Um, so yeah, that's why. And then uh, website, rvgd.co.uk. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for now. And as always available on Aveste as well. And it's always available <laughs> on Aveste, guys. Guys, you need to check Aveste out. Like, you will find brands on there that you didn't know that existed that you really should know exist. Like, they have put so much, like, ridiculous amount of time into networking and building with these brands that, you know, it's just stop buying with flannels. Stop buying with, you know some of these other companies stop buying with these fast fashion brands just give these guys a go you will not be disappointed appreciate that man but yeah thanks to everyone watching um, if you did like this give it a like and, and subscribe to our YouTube channel we've got lots more podcasts coming up um, with similar brands so um, yeah hope you enjoyed it and yeah see you soon see you soon